For over 50 years now, boys and girls and mums and dads have read and reread Kenneth Graham's magical story of Mr. Toad and his friends Ratty, Mole and Badger. Four animals who were sometimes so stupid and sometimes so wise that they were just like human beings. For those who have not yet had the pleasure of their company, and for the thousands who'd like to meet them again, this is the story of the wind in the willows. The mole had been working very hard all morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash, till he had dust in his throat and eyes, splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth all round him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then that suddenly he flung down his brush on the floor, said, bother, and oh, blow, and also hang spring cleaning, and bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something somewhere was calling him, so he made for the little tunnel that was his equivalent of a front drive, and he scraped and scrabbled and scratched and scraped again, working busily with his little claws, till at last, pop, his snout had come out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. Well, this is better than whitewashing, he said to himself, as soft, warm breezes caressed his brow. So jumping off all four legs at once, in the sheer delight of living, with the sounds of spring all round him, he pursued his way across the meadow. Hold up, said an elderly rabbit at the gap in the hedge. Sixpence for the privilege of passing by the private road. But he was bowled over in an instant by the impatient mole, who was so preoccupied with spring after a winter underground that he didn't even notice what had happened. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily, along the hedgerows where he found the birds building their nests in anticipation of the year that was unfolding around them. Flowers were budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy, progressive and occupied. And instead of feeling guilty at the spring cleaning he'd left behind, he could only feel happy to see such other busyness around him. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourself as to see all the other fellows working. He thought his happiness was complete as he meandered aimlessly along when suddenly he found himself by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before, this sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh. And he sat on the grass and looked at the river which chattered away to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. As he sat and looked, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. And dreamily he thought, what a nice snug dwelling place that would make for an animal with simple wants. But as he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, almost like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too small for a glowworm. And as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye. And around it, a brown little face with whiskers, a grave round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small neat ears and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. The two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Hello, Rat, said the Mole. Would you like to come over, said the Rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, 
said the mole, being completely new to a river and riverside ways. But even as he watched, the rat had unfastened a rope and was hauling in a little boat, which the mole had not observed. Within seconds, the rat had crossed the river and the mole's whole heart went out when the rat said, Hop in! Come and have a ride in a real boat! Do you know, said the mole, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a... You never... Good heavens, what have you been doing then? Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half as much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing about in... Look ahead, rat! cried the mole suddenly. But it was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. That's the charm of boats, really, said the rat, still lying on his back. Nothing really seems to matter, whether you arrive at your destination or whether you arrive somewhere else, or whether you never get anywhere at all. You're always busy and you're never doing anything in particular. In fact, it's such fun that, if you've nothing else on hand this morning, then supposing we drop down the river together and make a long day of it. The mole wiggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. What a day I'm having, he said. Let's start at once. And all ready for a day on the river, the mole settled down to snooze. The next thing the mole heard was Rat saying, How's this then? And in his hands was a fat wicker basket. But what's inside it? said the mole, full of curiosity. There's cold chicken inside it, replied the Rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled gherkin salad, French rolls, crisp sandwiches, potted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, soda water. Oh, stop, 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 cried the mole in ecstasies. This is just too much. Do you really think so? inquired the rat seriously. The other animals are always saying I never take enough on these excursions. And so the two new friends set off down the river. The water rat, like the good fellow he was, scowled steadily and forbore to disturb the mole, who was utterly intoxicated in this new life of sparkle and ripple and sounds and sunlight. After what seemed a very long time in this delightful state, the mole pulled himself together with an effort. Uh, so you uh, really live by the river? Well, what a jolly life that must be, Rat. By it, and with it, and on it, and in it, said the Rat. It's brother and sister to me, and aunts and company, and food and drink, and naturally washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. Lord, the times we've had together in all seasons. It's always got its fun and excitements. Sometimes, when the floods are on in February, my cellars are brimming with drink, and the brown water runs by my bedroom window. And sometimes, in the dry summer, I can potter about dry shod over most of the river bed, and find fresh food and things that careless people have dropped out of boats. What lies over there? asked the mole waving towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That? Oh, that's just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they uh, very nice people in there? said the mole, a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see. The squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it, wouldn't live anywhere else. Dear old Badger. Nobody interferes with him. They wouldn't dare. Well, uh, who should interfere with him? asked the Mole. Well, there are others, said the Rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and stoats and foxes and so on. They're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them. But really, you can't trust them, and that's the fact. The Mole dropped the subject, not wanting to dwell on possible trouble ahead, and asked, And uh, beyond the wild wood again, Rat, where it's blue and dim, uh, what's over there? 
Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the rat. And that doesn't matter to you or me, so let's not mention it again. And anyway, here's our backwater at last. Now we can have some lunch. And so the rat brought the boat alongside the bank and helped the still awkward mole ashore. They were at the edge of what appeared to be a small landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to the water's edge, whilst to one side a restless mill wheel turned in the weir, and the air was filled with the noise of foaming water against a gentle background murmur of slow-moving machinery. It was all very beautiful, and the mole could only say, Oh my, oh my, oh my. But by now the rat had unpacked the luncheon basket and one by one had unwrapped mysterious packets so that a veritable feast lay before them. Pigeon, old fellow, said the rat. But the mole, having been up since a very early hour that morning, had already pitched in. Between them they ate and ate and ate. And when they felt they could eat no more, they simply lay where they were on the warm sunlit grass and with the noises of spring all round them, they dozed off to sleep, little knowing just what adventures lay before them. In episode two, the mole meets Otter, hears tell of the unpredictable Mr. Toad, and finds out just how cold the river can be. three. The mole wasn't sure just how long he'd been dozing in the sun on this his first day on the river. It certainly seemed a long time since he and Rat had tucked into their enormous lunch. But what had caught his attention in his half-waking state was a streak of bubbles travelling along the surface of the river. What are you looking at, Mole? inquired the Rat. I'm looking, said the Mole, at those strange bubbles. Bubbles, ha-ha, said the rat in a cheery sort of way. And then a broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greedy beggars, he observed, making for the hamper. Why didn't you invite me, ratty? Well, this was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. Oh, by the way, my friend Mr. Mole, oh, proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out in the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace and then stumble upon you fellows. At least, uh, beg your pardon, I don't exactly mean that, you know. There was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge wherein last year's leaves still clung thick, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on, old badger, shouted the rat. The badger looked round at the assembled animals, grunted, Mmm, company, then turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Anyway, Otter, tell us who's out on the river today. Toad's out for one, replied the otter. In his brand new wager boat, new togs, new everything. <laughs> Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day. And a nice mess he made of it. 
Last year he was houseboating and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same, whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively. But no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them. And just then, a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, a short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, ignored him and kept sternly at his work. He'll be out of that boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. <laughs> of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you that good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad was staying... An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current, in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop, and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down. The voice was still in his ears, but not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again, there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune, and the mole, though still amazed, recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, for any reason or no reason whatsoever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. Now, I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He didn't speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, uh, please let me said the mole. So, of course, the rat let him. Packing the basket wasn't quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything. And although whenever he strapped up the basket, he realised he'd left something out, he got the job finished at last, without too much loss of temper. It was only then that Mole realised how tired and weary he was after his day of sunshine and fresh air, for it was all he could do to lift the basket and stagger with it down to the boat. You see, unlike the tough, weather-beaten rat, Mole was not really an out-of-doors chap at all, and a life underground hardly suits one to the rigours of riverside life. So, with a final heave, he managed to deposit himself and the basket in the boat, while the rat prepared to push off from the bank. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy sort of mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to Mole. In his tired state, the Mole watched the effortless sculling of his newfound companion, this confident riverside character, so knowledgeable, so strong, so dependable. But the Mole was not without his pride, so feeling already quite at home in a boat, so he thought, and a little envious and restless, he put to the rat what was slightly more than a question. Uh, ratty, uh, please, I, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've had a few lessons. It's not quite so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two. But he began to feel more and more jealous of Rat, sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the Rat, who'd been gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time. The triumphant Mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. Stop it, you silly ass, cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. You can't do it, you'll have us over. The mole flung the skulls back with a flourish, made a great dig at the water, and missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat, and the next moment, sploosh! Over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. 
Oh my, how cold the water was, and oh, how very wet it felt. How it sang in his ears as he went down, down, down. How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. And then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw as he was hauled to the surface. The rat got hold of the skulls and shoved them under the mole's arms, and swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal to the shore. The mole looked and felt a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. Once they'd clambered onto the bank, the rat said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again while I dive for the luncheon basket. So the dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about till he could feel some warmth pushing out the river cold and drying off his bedraggled fur. When he looked round, he realised that the rat had recovered the boat, righted her and made her fast, had rescued all his floating property by degrees, and was finally struggling ashore with the luncheon basket. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat. And as they set off, he said in a low voice, broken with emotion, Ratty, my generous friend, I'm very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. I indeed, I've been a complete ass and, and I know it. Please overlook it this once and forgive me and let things go on as before. That's all right, bless you, responded the rat cheerily. What's a little wet to a water rat? I'm more in the water than out of it most days. Don't think any more about it. And look here, I really think you'd better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, not like Toad's house at all. But of course you haven't seen that yet. Still, I can make you comfortable. And I'll teach you to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The Mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the Rat kindly looked in another direction, and so presently the Mole's spirits revived again, and he was even able to give some straight back talk to a couple of more hens who were sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him. And as they had their supper in front of the fire, the rat told him river stories, and very thrilling stories they were too, to an earth-dwelling animal like mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and night fishings with otter or excursions far afield with badger. Oh, supper was a most cheerful meal. But very shortly afterwards, a terribly sleepy mole just had to go to bed. And in the best bedroom, he laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his other new friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window. That day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learnt to swim and to row, and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. In our next episode, the rat and the mole visit Toad Hall, and Mr Toad takes them out onto the open road.
Ratty, said the mole suddenly, one bright and sunny morning. If you please, I want to ask you a favour. The rat was sitting on the riverbank saying poetry things to himself. In fact, he'd just composed a poem, so he was very taken up with it and wouldn't pay proper attention to Mole or anything else. Since early morning, he'd been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. And when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he'd dive down and tickle their necks just under where their chins would be if ducks had chins, till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at him. For it's impossible to say all you feel when your head's underwater. At last they implored him to go away. So he sat on the riverbank in the sun and murmured more of his poetry things all about the ducks, and he made it up as he went along. All along the backwater, hmm, through the rushes tall. Hmm. Ducks are a dabbling, up tails all. Hmm. Yes, that's not bad, said the rat to himself, who was really quite proud of his poetry. Now, how can I follow on to that? Let's see. Ducks' tails, drake's tails, yellow feet a quiver, yellow, mm -hmm, yellow, yellow bills out of sight, busy in the river. I don't know that I think so very much of that little poem, Rat observed the mole. What nonsense it all is. No, it isn't, said the rat indignantly. Oh, oh, oh it isn't, it isn't then, replied the mole. But uh, what I wanted to ask you was, won't you take me out to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for that day. Into the boat and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole, as he got into the boat and took the skulls while the rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good-natured and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses, and it may be that he's both boastful and conceited. But he's got some very great qualities, says Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the rat. And that creek on the left where the notice board says, Private, no landing allowed. That leads to his boathouse. And that's where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. And, and that's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad's rather rich, you know. This is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They tied up in the creek, in the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats, slung from the crossbeams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water. The place had an unused and a deserted air. The rat looked around him. Now I understand, said he. Boating's played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Come along, let's look him up. We'll hear all about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon, resting in a wicker garden chair, a preoccupied expression on his face, a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray, 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 he cried, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid. He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I, I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Let's sit quiet a bit, Toady said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remarks about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously, or anywhere else for that matter. Everyone admires it, especially old Ratty here, <laughs> don't you, Ratty? But anyway, look here, you're the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me, it's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose said the rat with an innocent air. 
You're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, poo boating interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I'd given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time. Makes me downright sorry to see you fellows spending all your energies in that aimless manner. No, I've discovered the real thing. The only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if you'll be so good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan. Shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's the real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs. Here today and gone tomorrow, the whole world before you. Ha, come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited to see the inside of the caravan. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, pots, pans, jugs, and kettles of every size and variety. It's all complete, said the toad triumphantly. You'll find that nothing whatsoever has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I... Beg your pardon, said the rat as he chewed a straw. But did I overhear you say something about we and start and this afternoon? <laughs> now, you, you dear good old ratty, said the toad imploringly. <laughs> Don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way because, well, you know, you've got to come. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and boat? I don't care, said the rat doggedly, and I'm not coming and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and a boat as I've always done. And what's more, Mole's going to stick to me and do just as I do, aren't you, Mole? Uh, 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 of course I am, said the Mole loyally. I'll always stick to you, Rat. All the same, it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know. Poor Mole. This fresh aspect of adventure was so tempting, and he'd fallen in love at first sight with the canary-coloured cart and all its little fitments. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered. He hated disappointing people, and he was fond of Mole and would do almost anything to oblige him. Toad was watching both of them very closely and suggested, diplomatically, that they might have some lunch. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad Hall always was, the toad simply let himself go. Disregarding the rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. He painted the prospects of the trip in such glowing colours that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Somehow it seemed taken for granted by all three of them that the trip was a settled thing. And the rat, though still unconvinced in his mind, allowed his good nature to override his personal objections. When they were quite ready, the now triumphant toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse, who, not having been previously consulted about the trip, was extremely annoyed. He frankly preferred the paddock, and the mole and the rat found he took a good deal of persuading. But at last, after telling him just how much fun that intended trip would be, they managed to convince him it would be worthwhile. So, at long last, the toad, mole and ratty set off. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them good day and said nice things about their beautiful cart. And rabbits sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows held up their forepaws and said, Oh my, oh my. Late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, 
they settled for a remote common far from habitation, where they turned the horse loose to graze, had their supper, and at last turned into their bunks. The toad kicked out his legs sleepily and said, Well, good night, you fellows. Ha, this is the real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. I don't talk about my old river, replied the patient rat. You know I don't, toad. But I think about it. I think about it all the time. The mole reached out from under his blanket, felt for the rat's paw in the darkness, and gave it a squeeze. I'll do whatever you like, Ratty, he whispered. Shall we run away tomorrow morning, quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole on the river? No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, we'll see it out, whispered back the rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by, Toad. It wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. This fad will soon be ended. The end was indeed near, nearer than any of the animals could have suspected as they settled down to sleep in the canary-coloured cart. Around them the stars grew fuller and larger, and a yellow moon, appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular, came to keep them company and watch over them through the night. In episode four, the toad goes off caravans. The rat definitely goes off toad, and the mole finds he's no match for a lively horse. Without a doubt, it was the artful persuasion of Mr. Toad that led the excited mole and the reluctant rat onto the open road in the canary-coloured caravan. Their first day had been great fun, but little did they know just what was in store. After so much open air and excitement, the Toad slept very soundly that first night of their venture, and Ratty and Mole had given up their efforts to rouse him out of bed the following morning because no amount of shaking had had any effect. So the rat turned to, quietly and manfully, and saw to the horse and the fire, and cleaned last night's cups and platters, and got things ready for breakfast. As for the mole, he was already back from the nearest village, where he'd been to fetch all the provisions that the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide for their journey. In fact, by the time the toad did appear on the scene, all the hard work had been done and the two workers were resting in a thoroughly exhausted state. They didn't take kindly to Toad's remarks then, when he said, What a pleasant, easy life this is. The fresh air, the sunshine, ha, no cares, no worries, and none of the fatigue of housekeeping. They had a pleasant ramble that day over grassy downs and along narrow by-lanes, moving at a slow pace so that they could take in with leisure the sights around them. But throughout that day and into the next, they made sure that the toad did his fair share of work. That isn't to say that whenever they turned their backs, he didn't try and slip away for another rest in his bunk. But they'd quickly get him out again and insist that he carried on with whatever chore he'd been put to. And so at their leisurely pace they roamed, Rat and Moe now thoroughly enjoying themselves. As for Toad, he was now by no means as rapturous about the simplicity of the primitive life. It was the afternoon of the second day, when they'd left the narrow lanes and had come out onto the high road, their first high road. They were strolling along easily, the mole by the horse's head, talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, and nobody considered him in the least. The toad and the water rat walking behind the cart, talking together, at least toad was talking, and Rat was saying at intervals, oh, Yes, uh, precisely. Uh, and what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very, very different. When, from far behind them, 
came a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark centre of energy advancing on them with incredible speed, while from out of the dust a faint poop poop wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. Hardly regarding it and little knowing the disaster that was about to overtake them, they turned to resume their conversation. Then it was upon them, in an instant blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump to the nearest ditch. The poop poop rang out with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, immense, breath-catching, passionate, with its driver tense and hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then dwindled to a speck in the far distance, changing back into a droning bee once more. The old grey horse, in this new, raw situation, simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions. Rearing, plunging, backing steadily, in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head and lively language directed at his better feelings, the horse drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant, and then... There was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart... Their pride and joy lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains, he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you, you highwaymen, you road hogs. I'll have the law on you. I'll report you through all the courts. His homesickness had slipped away from him. And for the moment, he was the skipper of the canary-coloured vessel, driven on a shoal by rival mariners. And he was trying to recollect all the fine and biting things he used to say to masters of steam launches when their wash used to flood the river bank and his parlour carpet at home. Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid, satisfied expression, and at intervals he faintly murmured, Poop, poop. The mole was busy trying to quieten the horse, which he succeeded in doing after a time. As for the cart, on its side in the ditch, it was indeed a sorry sight. Panels and windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine tins scattered over the wide world. The rat looked on and realised that even their efforts would not be sufficient to right the cart. Hi, Toad! they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The Toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road. So they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in a sort of trance, a happy smile on his face, his eyes still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals he was still heard to murmur, Poop, poop. The rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, Toad? He demanded sternly. Oh, glorious, stirring sight, murmured Toad, never offering to move. Oh, the poetry of motion, the real way to travel, the only way to travel. Here today, in next week, tomorrow, villages skipped, towns and cities jumped. Oh, always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss, oh, poop, poop, oh, my, my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad, cried the Mole, despairingly. And to think I never knew went on the Toad, all those wasted years that lay behind me. I never knew, never even dreamt. Oh, but now, now that I know, now that I fully realise, oh, what a flowery track lies before me henceforth. What dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way. What carts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset. Horrid little carts, common carts, canary-coloured carts. What are we to do with him? asked the mole of the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly, because there's nothing really to be done. You see, I know him of old. He's now possessed. He's got a new craze, and it always takes him that way in its first stage. He'll continue like that for days now, like an animal walking in a happy dream, quite useless for practical purposes. Ah, never mind him, though. Let's go and see what's to be done about the cart. 
A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would no longer travel. The axles were in a hopeless state, and the missing wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat knotted the horse's reins over his back and took him by the head. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town, and we'll just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. But what about Toad? asked the mole anxiously as they set off together. We, we can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by himself, in that distracted state. He it's not safe. Uh, supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother Toad, said the rat savagely. I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet behind them, and Toad caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still breathing short and staring into vacancy. Now look here, Toad, said the rat sharply. As soon as we get to town, you'll have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about that motor car and who it belongs to and lodge a complaint against it. And then you'll have to go to a blacksmith's or a wheelwright's and arrange for the car to be fetched and mended and put to rights. It'll take time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. Police station? A complaint? murmured Toad dreamily. Me? Complain of that, that, that beautiful, that heavenly vision that's been vouchsafed me? Mend the cart? I've done with carts forever. I never want to see the cart or hear of it again. Oh, Ratty, you can't think how obliged I am to you for consenting to come on this trip. I wouldn't have gone without you. And then I might never have seen that, that swan, that sunbeam, that thunderbolt. I might never have heard that entrancing sound or smelled that bewitching smell. I owe it to you, my best of friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it is, he said to the mole across Toad's head. He's quite hopeless. I give it up. When we get to the town, we'll go to the railway station, and with a bit of luck, we might pick up a train there that'll get us back to Riverbank tonight. And if you ever get me going a pleasuring again with this provoking animal, pa! And for the rest of that weary trudge, he addressed his remarks exclusively to Mole. It was many hours later that Ratty, Mole, and the still bewitched Toad sat back thoroughly exhausted on a slow train heading in the direction of Toad Hall. Their walk to the station had been bad enough, for on several occasions they'd found it necessary to carry Toad, who seemed blissfully unaware of all they said to him. But perhaps it was just as well, for the rat had used some very harsh language. The horse they'd left in a stable until he could be collected, and the stable man had said he'd go out and do what he could for the cart. So absolutely tired were they on the train journey that they said not a word to each other. But at long last they arrived at Toad Hall, where they escorted the spellbound Toad inside his door and gave instructions to his housekeeper to feed him, undress him and put him to bed. It was the following evening, and the mole, who'd risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing. The rat, who'd been looking up his friends and gossiping, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else being talked about all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he's ordered a large and very expensive motor car. <laughs> In episode five of The Wind in the Willows, the mole sets out to meet Badger and experiences the terror of the wild wood. Some along, the mole had stayed with his friend, the water rat. The mole, who'd been so timid and overawed by river life at first, 
He hadn't known how to row a boat, how to swim, who to talk to, and who not to talk to. But now he had the hang of all these things. You see, not only was the pace of life different on the riverbank from the lonely life the mole had known underground, but there was a certain riverside etiquette which can't be described in words. It was something that you picked up as you went along, and the mole had done just that. And as summer passed into autumn and the leaves fell from the trees, a rich golden mellowness set in along the river bank, and the mole still stayed on, quite accepted by everyone on the river. Eventually came the winter, when the water ran so fast and high that boating was out of the question, and swimming was just a memory from the warm summer days that had passed. In the winter, nothing very much happened on the river. In fact, most of the residents slept a good deal, and when they woke, they'd call on each other and compare notes on the past summer and all its doings. They'd then have tea together by glorious blazing fires, before setting off home again and going to sleep once more, to dream of the Prince of Spring, who'd kiss that sleeping summer back to life, so that the whole round of sun-kissed adventures could begin once more. And these were just the thoughts that were going through Rat's mind one cold winter afternoon as he sat before the fire, snug and content. He'd been there for hours, writing down rhymes on a paper on his lap and saying more poetry things to himself until at last he dozed off to sleep. I say, Ratty, said the Mole from the other fireside chair. Hey, what is it? said the Rat, waking up with a start. I was just wondering said the Mole. One often hears a lot about Badger on the river. Everyone seems to respect him, but he never shows himself. I've only seen him once, and, and briefly, on the day of our first picnic. Why don't we invite him round for dinner or something? Or perhaps even go to his house and look him up? Oh, I'm afraid that dinners, invitations and social occasions are not in Badger's line of country at all, said the Rat. And as for visiting him, he lives right in the middle of the wild wood, so that's right out of the question. It wasn't the first time that Rat had said this about Badger or the wild wood, and it made the Mole very curious. He'd often wanted to find out more about Badger. And as the Rat composed himself once more for a snooze, the Mole decided that perhaps he'd go off on his own and look at this wild wood that nobody went near, and perhaps he might even meet Badger himself. So, leaving the rat now fast asleep, he tiptoed out of the room. It was a cold, still afternoon, with a hard, steely sky overhead as he set off. Copses, dells, quarries and all hidden places, which had been mysterious mines for exploration in summer, were now exposed. But to the mole it was exhilarating. So with great spirits he pushed on towards the wild wood, which lay before him, low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm him at first. Twigs crackled under his feet and logs tripped him, but all that was fun and exciting. He penetrated on to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder and indistinctly that he thought he first saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things or there'd simply be no end to it. And then, yes, Certainly a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly in every hole far and near there were hundreds of faces, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the bank, he thought, there'd be no more faces. So he swung off the path and he plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him, or was it in front? But it made him hurry. And then it grew louder and became very frightening. He was alone and unarmed, and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. 
he thought it was only falling leaves at first. Then as it grew, he knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet. It grew and multiplied from every quarter and seemed to be closing in on him. Then a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. It dashed past with a set face and staring eyes. Get out of this, you fool! The mole heard him mutter as he made for a friendly burrow. And now the whole wood seemed to be running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. And in panic, the mole too began to run. Aimlessly, he knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, and at last threw himself into the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree, which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety. But who could tell? And as he lay there, panting and trembling, he knew at last that dreadful thing from which the rat had vainly tried to shield him. The terror of the wild wood. Meanwhile, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses had slipped from his knee, and as he snoozed, he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped from the fire, and he woke with a start. He looked round for the mole, but the mole wasn't there. He listened for a time, but the house seemed very quiet. Moley, he called, but there was no reply. Moley, are you there? But again, no answer. He went into the hall. Missing from its accustomed peg was the mole's cap, and his galoshes were also gone. Then looking round, he saw that the front door was open, and there, on the muddy surface of the ground, he saw the mole's tracks, a line of imprints leading straight and purposeful, direct to the wild wood. With dark, menacing clouds in the sky and dusk setting in, the rat plunged without hesitation into the wood. Tucked into his belt, a brace of pistols. In his hand, a short, stout cudgel. He looked anxiously on either side of him for any sign of his friend. And though at first he heard a whistling and a pattering from behind, it soon died away. For it was plain for anyone to see that the rat was set on a manful task and was prepared for anything. Moly! Molly, he called as he traversed the wood in the gathering gloom. Molly, where are you? It's me, old rat. He must have kept up his searching and calling for an hour or more, when at last, from a hollow beneath an old beech tree, a timid little voice called out, Ratty! R Ratty! Is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found the mole, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried. I've been so frightened, you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, Mole. I did my best to keep you from it. There are a hundred things one has to know about coming to the wood. Passwords and signs and sayings which have power and effect. You've got to know them if you're small or you'll find yourself in trouble. Anyway, we ought to start for home now. It'd never do to spend the night here. Oh, dear Ratty said the mole imploringly. I'm simply dead beat, and that's a fact. You must let me rest a while to get my strength back, if I'm to get home at all. And so the understanding rat sat down at the mouth of the little hollow, still with the pistol in his hand, and kept guard, while the mole, having covered himself with dry leaves, dozed off. It was then that the snow began to fall. It collected on the branches of trees and on the undergrowth, Holes, hollows, pools and pitfalls vanished fast, and a gleaming white carpet was springing up everywhere. Down in the hollow of the old beech tree, the rat, who'd allowed the mole to sleep for quite a while, stuck his head out, and when he saw the snow, called out, Come on, mole, old chap, wake up! It's snowing. We must make a move for home. An hour or two later, they'd lost all count of time and they pulled up, dispirited and completely lost. They regained their breath and considered what action to take. Well, there's only one thing to do, said the rat. We'll make for that little dell down there and see if we can find some shelter, something with a dry floor and out of the wind. We can then rest a while and have another girt getting home when we feel a little stronger. It was in the dell that the mole suddenly tripped up and fell on his face in the snow. Oh, my leg, my poor leg, he cried. 
but the rat was staring down at what the mole had tripped over. And when the mole looked too, he saw to his astonishment of all things, a door scraper revealed in the snow. The rat frantically shoveled at the snow and then, I thought so, I thought so, he cried. Here's a doormat. Pretty scruffy it is, but it's a doormat. The mole really couldn't understand what on earth the rat was talking about. But as he sat nursing his leg, the rat suddenly disappeared in a flurry of white as the snow on all sides of him collapsed and he lay worn out but with a happy grin slowly spreading all over his little face. There, where the snow had been, was a solid little door. Beside it a bell pull, and above it in large lettering were the words, Mr. Badger. It's hard to describe the immense relief felt by both the animals. It seemed that they'd been saved a fate they dared not think about. The mole, forgetting all about his bruised leg, leapt into the air to clutch at the bell pull, and as he swung with both feet off the ground, they both heard from quite a long way off a deep, toned bell pealing in response. In episode six, the mole at long last meets Mr. Badger. Poor Mole, how exhausted and terrified he'd felt, alone in the vast wild wood. And how thankful he was that Rat had found him. But then in the thick snow they'd become lost. Lost, that is, until they stumbled upon the front door of Mr. Badger. As the Rat waited patiently in the cold night air, with snow still falling, stamping his feet in an effort to keep warm, he could hear the deep toned chimes responding to the efforts of Mole on the bell pull. There was the noise of a bolt pulled back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. The next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time disturbing people on such a night? Speak up, whoever you are. Oh, Badger, cried the Rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. Why, Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the Badger in a quite different tone. Why, you must be perished. Bless my soul, lost in the snow, in the wild wood too, and at this time of night, come along in at once. The Mole followed the Rat down a long, shabby passage. Off it he could see, dimly, other passages, mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors as well, stout, oaken, comfortable-looking doors. The badger followed up behind, wearing a long dressing gown and slippers that were down at heel. This isn't the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. Oh, but let's go to the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything else. The badger flung open one of the stout oak doors, and there, glowing in the light of a log fire, was a large room that seemed a place fit for heroes to feast in after victory. The floor was well-worn red brick. Around the fire were two settees with high backs and made for comfort and ease. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down either side. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions and baskets of eggs. The plates on the dresser grinned at the pots on the shelf, 
the merry firelight flickered and played over everything. The Mole had never felt more secure in his whole life. All that he'd suffered in the trackless wild wood seemed a half-forgotten dream. Within no time at all, the Badger had piled food before them, and they told him their story through mouthfuls of food and with their elbows on the table. You may think that was very rude, which of course it was, but the Badger took no notice. You see, he didn't do a lot of entertaining. He had the idea that these things didn't really matter. He sat in his armchair and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story. He wasn't surprised or shocked or anything, and never said, I told you so, or, oh dear, oh dear, and the Mole began to feel very friendly towards him. And when at last they'd finished supper and were feeling warm, content and full, they sat round the great wood fire, and the Badger said, Now then, what's the news from your part of the world? How's old Toad getting along? From bad to worse, said the Rat gravely. Another smash-up last week and a bad one. He will insist on driving himself, and he's so incapable. But he thinks that nobody can teach him anything, and all the rest follows. Do you know he's had seven crashes now? And he's been in hospital three times, put in the Mole, and had to pay some very heavy fines. Yes, and that's part of the trouble, went on the Rat. I know Toad's rich, but he's not a millionaire. He'll be ruined or killed before long. Badger... We are his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? Well, look here, said the Badger. I can't do anything now, as I'm sure you understand. And his two friends did indeed understand. No animal is expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. After arduous days and nights in the summer, when their muscles and nerves have been so severely tested, Winter was the time for rest and sleep. But I tell you what, said the Badger, once the spring comes and we're wanting to be out once more, how about then? All the animals agreed that then they would do something about the wayward toad. And with that, the Badger escorted the Rat and the Mole to the guest room. Even here was the overflow of Badger's winter stores. All around were piles of apples, turnips and potatoes, baskets full of nuts and jars of honey. But to one side, two soft and inviting little beds, clean and smelling of lavender. Within thirty seconds of tumbling into them, the rat and the mole, full of joy and contentment, were fast asleep. The two animals came down to breakfast very late next morning. There was a bright fire burning in the kitchen and two young hedgehogs sitting at a bench at the table eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls. Good heavens, where have you youngsters come from? said the rat pleasantly. Lost your way in the snow, I suppose. Uh, yes, please, sir, said the elder of the two hedgehogs. Uh, we were trying to find our way to school in the snow and we lost ourselves, sir, and little Billy here got frightened, and we happened up against Mr. Badger's front door, and Mr. Badger, being the kind-hearted gentleman he is, as everyone knows, I understand, said the rat, cutting himself some rashers from a side of bacon. And where's Mr. Badger now? He's in his study, sir, and he says he's very busy and on no account to be disturbed. They all sat down to breakfast, fully understanding what the Badger had meant about not being disturbed. The fact is, as already mentioned, that when you live a life of full activity for six months of the year and of near sleep for the other six, you can't be continually pleading tiredness to guests. It sounds rude. And the animals knew full well that after eating a hearty breakfast, the badger had returned to his study, settled himself in an armchair, put his handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way. The front doorbell clanged loudly, and one of the hedgehogs rushed off to see who it might be. There was the sound of voices and stamping in the hall, and then who should walk into the room but the otter. Thought I'd find you here, said the otter. There's a great state of alarm along the river bank. They said Rat and Mole hadn't come home last night. Thought something dreadful must have happened, especially with all this thick snow lying about. But then I thought that anyone in trouble comes to Badger. So along I came. The otter joined them at the table and helped himself to breakfast. 
My, what a lovely sight it was coming through the wood. The white snow, the red sun rising, and stillness everywhere. Could have stayed and had fun there for hours in all that snow. About halfway through, I came across a rabbit, stupid creature, sitting on a stump. Had to cuff his ears a bit to get any sense out of him. Still, he told me how you'd lost your way, Mole, and how they were out hunting and chivying around. The Mole looked on in awe at this seemingly fearless animal talking so casually about the terrible wild wood. I asked that fool rabbit, went on the otter, why he and his many friends didn't take you, Moley, down a burrow and give you shelter. But he just looked dim and stupid. They're all the same, those rabbits. Oh, uh, weren't you at all nervous coming through the wood? asked the mole. Nervous, said the otter. I'd give them nerves if any of them tried anything on me. <sighs> A loud yawn came from the doorway, and there stood the still sleepy badger. Hello, otter, he said. And then seeing the two hedgehogs still there, he told them it was time to go or their mother would be getting worried, and he sent them off with a pat on the head and sixpence in their pockets. It was well after lunch, and the badger, knowing the mole to be another underground creature, was showing him around his home. They walked through a labyrinth of tunnels, and by the light of the badger's lantern, the mole was astonished to see this vast underground empire. There were rooms on either side, some small and absolutely packed with winter stores, some vast, the size of Toad's dining hall. And as they went round on their expedition, the badger and mole both agreed how only underground, away from the weather and the overflowing rivers, away from draughts and noisy neighbours, could an animal feel really safe, secure and happy. And here and there were arches and pillars and even pavements. And the badger explained how many thousands of years ago a city had stood at this spot, which had since been overcome by nature's growth, and that all he'd done was excavate the various passages and rooms, and he hadn't needed to shore up the structure at all. When they got back to the kitchen, the rat was dressed and ready for the outdoors, complete with his pistols and cudgel. Come on, Mole, he said. We ought to make a move for home now. We don't want to spend another night in the wild wood. So all four animals set off this time down the tunnels to a secret exit that the badger assured them would bring them out on the edge of the wood and not far from the river bank. And soon they were out in the open again, in the cold winter's air, the otter, the rat and the mole trudging across a large field. Before them they could see a glint of their familiar old river while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon. For a moment, the mole paused and looked back at the whole mass of the wild wood, dense and menacing in its vast white surroundings. And then the mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow, linked to the ploughed furrow, the frequented pasture, the cultivated garden plot. For others, perhaps, the stubborn endurance, the clash of actual combat that went with nature in the rough. But he must be wise must keep to the present places in which his lines were laid and which held adventure enough in their way to last for a lifetime. In episode seven, the mole feels homesick. So on a cold winter's night, he takes the rat through woods, fields and hedges to find Mole End. sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air. 
The two animals hastened by in high spirits, with much chatter and laughter. They were returning across country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams which fed their own river had their first small beginnings. The shades of the short winter day were closing in on them and they still had some distance to go. Plodding at random across the fields, they'd heard the sheep and had made for them and now leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking much easier. And it also responded to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakingly, yes, quite right, this way leads to home. It looks as though we're coming to a village, said the mole dubiously, slackening his pace. The animals did not hold with villages, and their own highways normally kept well away from such places. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year, they're all safe indoors by now, sitting round the fire, men, women and children, dogs and cats and all. We'll step through all right without any bother or unpleasantness. And we can also have a look at them through their windows, if you like, and see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over the thin fall of powdery snow. On either side of the street, squares of a dusky orange red, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low lattice windows were without curtains or blinds, and the mole and the rat looked in on gatherings around the fire and tea table, on laughter and gestures, on warmth and comfort. Moving at will from window to window, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes as they watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretched before the fire. From one small window, the sense of home and its safety from the outside stresses of nature most pulsated. Clearly silhouetted, a cage, and its small fluffy occupant, with head well tucked into feathers, fast asleep. Then a gust of bitter wind swept by them. A small sting of frozen sleet on their skin woke them as from a dream. And they knew their toes to be cold and their legs tired and their own home a weary distance away. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness the friendly fields again. And they braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end sometime in the rattle of the door latch, the sudden firelight and the sight of familiar things. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper, for it was pitch dark and he was in strange country and was following the rat and leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was, his shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the grey road in front of him. So he didn't notice poor Mole, when suddenly he stopped dead in his tracks, with his nose in the air, and stood absolutely motionless. You see, we humans have long lost our understanding of nature, and we have only the word smell to describe the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning, warning, inciting, repelling. What had reached the mole through the darkness was one of those mysterious fairy calls, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal, though as yet he couldn't think what it was. And then it was with him again as he stood in the falling snow, and this time he knew exactly what it was. Home, that was it, that soft touch wafting through the air. Why, it must be close by at this very moment, he told himself. His old home that he'd never returned to since that first eventful day on the river. And the mole sat down forlornly in the snow, for now he realised what had happened. He must indeed be near his old home, and sensing him go by, it had called to him small, 
shabby and poorly furnished, his little home was missing him and was telling him so sorrowfully with the plaintive reminder that it was there and wanted him. Ratty, called out the mole. Come back, I, I want you, quick. Oh, do come along, mole, replied the rat cheerfully, still plodding on into the darkness. Please stop, Ratty, pleaded the poor mole in anguish. You don't understand. It's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it, and it's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty, please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the mole was calling, too far to catch the note of appeal in his voice. Mole, we really mustn't stop now, he called back. We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you've found. It's late and the snow's getting worse and I'm not sure of the way. Anyway, I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick, there's a good fella. Poor Mole dragged himself to his feet. He stood alone in the night, his heart torn asunder and a big sob gathering somewhere low down inside him. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never did he dream of abandoning him. With an effort, he caught up with the unsuspecting rat, who chattered cheerfully about what they would do when they got home. How jolly the fire would be, what a supper they'd have. But the rat never noticed the mole's silence and distress. At last, however, after they'd walked some considerable distance, the rat said kindly, Look here, mole, old chap, you seem dead tired. Let's sit down and rest for a while. After all, we can't be far from home now. The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried so hard to control himself. But the sob he'd fought with for so long forced its way up, followed by another, then another, till at last he gave up and cried freely and helplessly, realising he had lost what he could hardly claim to have found. The rat was quiet for a while, and then said gently, what is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter? Now tell us your trouble and let's see if I can help. The mole was so unhappy, so sad, that at first he could find no words at all. But then, between sobs, he explained to Rat, I, I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, not like your cosy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or, or Badger's great house. But it was my own little home, <laughs> and I was fond of it, and I went away and forgot all about it. But just then, back along the road, I smelt it suddenly, and I called to you and you wouldn't listen. But everything was coming back to me with a rush, and I wanted it. Oh, we might have had just one look at it, Ratty, only one look. It was so close. But you wouldn't turn back. You wouldn't turn back. The rat stared down into the snow and said nothing. He realised just how cruel he'd been. He saw it all now. He'd been so intent on getting to his own home with its food and warmth that he hadn't sensed the mole's anguish. So setting off over the very ground they'd just covered, the rat said, Come on, old chap, or we'll, we'll never get there. But where are you going, ratty? said the mole. We are going to find that old home of yours, mole replied the rat. Oh, come back, ratty, do, called the mole into the darkness. It's too late, too dark, and I didn't mean to tell you how I felt about it. And think of Riverbank and your supper. Hang Riverbank and supper too, said the rat. I tell you, I'm going to find this place now, even if it takes me all night. So cheer up, follow me, and we'll soon be there. And so they went back over their tracks along the dark road with the rat keeping up a steady flow of cheerful talk. And when he thought he was near the spot, the rat said, Right, no more talking, business now. Use your nose, Mole, and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for a while. And then suddenly the rat sensed that the Mole was onto something. He fell back a pace and waited. The signals were coming through. 
Mole stood with his nose uplifted, quivering slightly and feeling the air. And then he began to advance, slow, steady and confident, with something of the air of a sleepwalker. He crossed a dry ditch, scrambled up a bank and through a hole in the hedge, nosed his way over a field towards a small copse of trees, and his pace quickened as the signals became stronger. The rat, following at a distance, felt excitement, for surely now they were getting near the place. It was beyond the copse, and halfway across an open field, that without any warning the mole dived down a tunnel. The rat followed him into pitch darkness, and for what seemed a very long time, they crawled through twists and turns until the mole struck a match. And by its light, the rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded. And directly facing them was Mole's front door, with Mole End painted in Gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. And so Mole, in the company of Rat, had rediscovered his long-forgotten home. In episode eight, Mole plays host to some old acquaintances. How sad the mole had been that night, when passing near his old home, he'd sensed it calling and had passed it by. But how happy he now was that they'd come back and found this long forgotten dwelling. So with the match burning low, he reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it. They were standing in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood at one side of the door and on the other a roller for the mole was a tidy animal and couldn't stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statues. Down one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley with benches along it and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish and surrounded by a cockleshell border. Out of the center of the pond rose a fanciful stand clothed in more cockleshells and topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. The mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so dear to him and he hurried rat right through the door and into his old home. But here he saw the dust lying thick on everything and there were the brushes and dusters he'd left lying around from his spring cleaning. It all had the cheerless, deserted look of a long neglected house with its narrow, meagre dimensions, its worn and shabby contents. Oh, ratty, cried the mole dismally. Why did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place and on a night like this, when you might have been at River Bank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire? The rat paid no attention whatsoever to the mole. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he called out cheerily. So compact, so well planned, everything here and in its place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing we want's a good fire. I'll see to that. So this is the parlour. Splendid! And those little sleeping bunks in the wall. Your idea, eh? How first rate. Now, I'll fetch the wood and the coals, and you get a duster, bowl. You'll find one in the drawer on the kitchen table. And try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. And so encouraged was he by the rat's enthusiasm that the mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. 
he hailed the mole to come and warm himself. But Mole had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in his duster. Oh, rat, he moaned. How about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser quite distinctly, and everybody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in the neighbourhood. Rouse yourself, Mole, pull yourself together and come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer. The result was not so depressing after all, though of course it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of biscuits, nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. Now there's a banquet for you, observed the rat as he arranged the table. I know some animals who'd give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight. Well, perhaps you're right, said the mole, but oh dear, we've no bread, no butter, no pate, no champagne, continued the rat, grinning. And that reminds me, What's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course. Just you wait a minute. And in a flash, the rat had disappeared through the door and down the dark steps. And from within the cellar came a confusion of noises, of cupboards being opened and slammed shut, of boxes being moved, the noise of somebody hunting in earnest for something. And then the rat reappeared, with dust on his clothes and cobwebs over his face, and tucked under each arm a bottle of beer. Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mole, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I was ever in. Then, while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks, the Mole, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, told how it all came about. How this was planned and that was thought out, and how a windfall from an aunt had come just at the right time, and with that he'd been able to buy, carefully of course and over a period of time, the various treasured items that turned his house into a home. The rat was desperately hungry, but strove to conceal it, nodding seriously and saying, wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given him. At last they did sit down at the table, and the rat, with a flourish, went to work on the sardine tin. And then he stopped and listened. Upon my soul, he said, I could have sworn I heard singing. I do hear singing. Now who in heaven's name can that be at this hour? And for a moment, the two animals sat and listened. I think that must be the field mice, said the mole after a while. And he felt rather proud as he explained how every year at that time they'd come a caroling and they never missed Mole End. It's really quite like old times to hear them again, he said. Quite like old times. Uh, let's go and say hello to them. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a lantern, eight little field mice stood in a semicircle, their shrill voices rising in the night air. Let's be fair, in the stable when they did dwell, joy shall be theirs in the morning, joy shall be theirs in the morning, joy shall be theirs in the morning. And as the voices ceased, and the mole and rat looked on, from up above and far away, down through the tunnel to Mole End, came the sound of distant bells, the joyful peals of Christmas time. Well sung, well sung indeed, said the rat. And now come along in, all of you, and warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot. It really is like old times said the mole as he shepherded the field mice in before the fire. Now pull up that city and just wait a minute and... Oh, ratty, he cried. Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them. Well, just you leave that to me, said the masterful rat. 
Now, you with the lantern, come over here a minute. And the rat found out from the mouse that even at that late hour, there were a number of shops still open where they might buy food and drink. So he gave instructions saying exactly what he wanted and eventually sent the mouse off armed with money and basket and lantern. The rest of the field mice perched in a row in front of the fire, swinging their legs from the settee and toasting their chilblains till they tingled. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible, Mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, Mole, while I draw the corks. And very soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way. And they wiped their eyes and laughed and forgot that they'd ever been cold in their lives. And there they sat for nearly an hour by the fire, and Rat told them stories about the river, and eyes agog the mice looked on at this tough character and were glad indeed that he was a friend. And then Mole explained how he had learnt the ways of the river, and how different it was for such a quiet living fellow like himself. He told them of floods and droughts, of picnics and excursions, and had them in the hollow of his hand when he mentioned his dreadful adventure in the wild wood. And that was how they passed the time, until the latch clicked and the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. It wasn't long before everything was laid out on the table, under the generalship of the rat. The mole took the head of the table, and in a sort of dream he saw what had been a barren board, now set thick with savoury comforts. The faces of his little friends brightened and beamed as they set to without delay. What a happy homecoming it had turned out to be after all. They ate and they talked, and the rat made sure that everyone had just what he wanted, and plenty of it. Long after they'd all gone home, grateful and happy, warm without and within, the mole and the rat were sitting by the remnants of the fire, drinking a final nightcap of mulled ale. They'd discussed the events of the long day, and at last the rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, <gasps> Mole, old fellow, oh, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That's obviously your bunk over there, so I'll take this one. Oh, what a ripping little house it is. Everything's so handy. And the rat clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in his blankets and fell fast asleep. But before the weary mole closed his eyes, he looked round his old room, mellow in the last flickerings of the fire. And his gaze rested on friendly and familiar things, which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and were now happy to have him back. He didn't want to turn his back on his new life of sunshine and fresh air in the river bank. The call of that upper world was too strong. But it was good to know that he had this place to come home to, which could always be counted on for the same simple welcome. In episode nine, the summer returns to river bank, and Mole, Ratty and Badger set out to keep a winter's promise, to take the wayward toad in hand. It was a bright morning in the early part of summer. The hot sun seemed to be pulling everything green and bushy and spiky up out of the earth towards him, as if by strings. The mole and the water rat had been up since dawn, very busy on matters connected with boats and the opening of the boating season, painting and varnishing, mending paddles, repairing cushions, hunting for missing boat hooks. 
They were finishing breakfast in their little parlour when a heavy knock sounded at the door. Oh, bother, said the rat. Sue it is, bowl like a good chap since you've finished breakfast. The mole went to attend the summons and the rat heard him utter a cry of surprise. And no wonder, for there standing in the parlour door was Mr. Badger. This was a wonderful thing indeed, that the badger should pay a formal call on them, or indeed on anybody. He generally had to be caught, if you wanted him badly, as he slipped quietly along a hedgerow of an early morning or a late evening, or else hunted up in his own house in the middle of the wood, which was a serious undertaking. The rat was so amazed to see this most welcome but unexpected visitor that he spilt egg all over the tablecloth and sat open-mouthed. The badger took up a position by the fire. The hour has come, he said at last with great solemnity. Oh, oh what hour? asked the rat uneasily, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. Toad's hour, the hour of toad. I said I'd take him in hand as soon as the winter was well over, and I'm going to take him in hand today. Toads are, of course, cried the mole delightedly. Hooray, hooray, I remember now. We'll teach him to be a sensible toad. This very morning, continued the badger, taking an armchair, as I learnt last night from a trustworthy source, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall. At this very moment, perhaps, Toad is busy arraying himself in those singularly hideous garments so dear to him, which transform him from a comparatively good-looking toad into an object which throws any decent-minded animal that comes across it into a violent fit. We must be up and doing ere it is too late. You two animals will accompany me instantly to Toad Hall. Right you are! cried the rat, jumping up. We'll convert him. He'll be the most converted toad that ever was before we're done with him. They set off up the road on their mission of mercy, Badger leading the way. Animals, when in company, walk in a proper and sensible manner in single file, instead of sprawling all across the road and being of no use or support to each other in case of sudden trouble or danger. They reached the carriage drive of Toad Hall to find, as the badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car, painted a bright red, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, cap, gaiters, and enormous overcoat, came swaggering down the steps. Hello! Come on, you fellows! he cried cheerfully. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... Uh, to come for a jolly... Uh, for... Oh dear, his hearty accents faltered and came to a sad end as he noticed the stern, unbending looks on the faces of his silent friends. I'm afraid you won't be wanted today, said Badger, calling out to the chauffeur in charge of the new motor car. Mr. Toad has changed his mind. He'll not require the car. And as for you, Toad, we're taking you inside. And Mr. Toad, struggling and protesting, was carried back inside Toad Hall. Now then, said the badger to Toad, as all four of them stood together in the hall. First of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shan't, replied the Toad with great spirit. What is the meaning of this gross outrage? I demand an instant explanation. In that case, said the badger to his two companions, Take them off for him. They had to lay Toad out on the floor, kicking and calling all sorts of names before they could properly get to work. Then the rat sat on him and the mole got his motoring clothes off him bit by bit. And as they did it, his blustering spirit slowly evaporated. At last, stripped of his driving togs, he sat alone on the floor, forlorn and deflated. And the badger addressed him. You knew that it must come to this sooner or later, Toad, he said. You've disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you, and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district by your furious driving and your smashes and rows with the police. Independence is all very well, 
but we animals never allow our friends to make fools of themselves beyond a certain limit. And that limit you've reached. You will come with me into the smoking room, and there you'll hear some facts about yourself. And we'll see if you come out of that room the same toad that you went in. Through the door, the mole and the rat, now sitting comfortably in armchairs, could hear the long, continuous drone of the badger's voice, rising and falling in waves of oratory. That's no good, said the rat contemptuously. Talking to Toad will never cure him. He'll say anything. And then they noticed that the long sermon from the smoking room was being punctuated at intervals by long, drawn-out sobs, evidently proceeding from the bosom of Toad, who was a soft-hearted and affectionate fellow, very easily converted, for the time being, to any point of view. After some three quarters of an hour, the door opened, and the badger reappeared, solemnly holding by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. His skin hung baggily about him, his legs wobbled, and his cheeks were furrowed by the tears so plentifully called forth by the badger's moving discourse. My friends, said the badger, I'm pleased to inform you that Toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He's truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. That's very good news, said the mole gravely. Very good news indeed, observed the rat dubiously. If only, if only... He was looking very hard at Toad as he said this, and could not help thinking he perceived something vaguely resembling a twinkle in that animal's sorrowful eye. There's only one more thing to be done, continued the badger. Toad, I want you to solemnly repeat all those promises you made before your friends here. There was a long pause, and then suddenly, but stoutly, the toad said, No, I'm not sorry, and it wasn't folly at all. It was simply glorious. I'd have said anything in there. You're so eloquent, dear Badger, so moving, so convincing. But I realise now that I'm not a bit sorry or repentant, and it's no good saying I am, is it? And furthermore, I promise faithfully that the first motor car I see, I shall jump in and drive away. Upstairs with him at once, roared the Badger. So Mole and Rat again made for the Toad, and picking him up bodily as he fumed and protested, they hauled him up the ornate staircase of Toad Hall. It was no easy job. All the way he struggled, while the badger from the bottom of the stairs called out, I hoped it wouldn't come to this, Toad, but you've so often asked the three of us to come and stay with you here at Toad Hall, and now we're going to. Take him to his bedroom, you two, and lock the door. It was several days later. The mole was dozing in the sunshine in the gardens of Toad Hall. The three animals had worked out a system whereby one of them would at all times be on guard outside Toad's room until he'd worked the poison out of his system. Rat was on his way up the stairs to take over the watch from Badger, who was itching to stretch his legs, and was to take Mole for a long ramble through his woods. As for Toad, he lay in bed, pale and seemingly without spirit. In fact, so ill did he look that the rat was a little worried. Dear kind rat, said the toad feebly from the bed, might I ask you a favour? Well, what is it, toad? asked rat. Well, I, I hate to be an additional burden, said toad, but I think you'd better run along and fetch the doctor to me, and while you're about it, ask the lawyer to come, and quickly, please, dear ratty, as I fear the end is not far off. Now come on, Toady, said the rat. Whatever it is that ails you, I'm sure it's not all that bad. You're just a trifle off colour. And then the rat thought to himself, well, I've known Toad to be ill before, but never ask for a lawyer. Perhaps I'd better go in case. No doubt the doctor will tell him all is well, but I'd better be on the safe side. 
A few minutes later, the rat was walking down the driveway on his errand of mercy. He'd locked the door carefully and expected to be back in a very short time. But what he didn't realise was that as he walked, a small <laughs> laughing figure was watching him from above. It was the toad. As soon as he'd heard the key turn in the lock, he'd leapt out of bed, dressed as quickly as possible in his smartest suit, and filled his pockets with cash. By the time Rat was out of sight, a line of knotted sheets hanging from Toad's window told what had happened. And Toad himself was marching off, light-heartedly whistling a merry tune, in the very opposite direction to Rat. In episode 10, the toad once again hears the turn of a key in a lock. But this time his jailers are far less sympathetic. Badger and Mole were hurrying back to Toad Hall after their walk in the woods. So delighted had they been to be out in the open again, after several days of sitting around the hall guarding Toad and waiting for him to show some sign of repentance, that they'd lost all count of time. The Badger very much enjoyed the company of the Mole. In fact, the two of them seemed to understand each other very well, which was no doubt because they were both by nature underground animals, both fairly quiet, and not great ones for a busy social life or idle conversation. But now, realising they were late for lunch, they made haste through the fields and copses, over fences and across streams. At last they came to the driveway, and they strode up ready now for their meal, for the exercise and fresh air had given them a sharp appetite. I think, said the badger, that I shall have with my food a glass of toad's beer, nice, cool and... The badger stopped dead in his tracks. He was staring ahead of him, looking upwards towards the hall. Bless my soul, whatever can that be, he said. If it's what I think it is, whatever can what be, queried the mole. And what do you think it is? Up there, hanging from Toad's bedroom window, said the badger. And the mole looked up to see the knotted sheet, just as Toad had left it when he made his escape. What a gloomy luncheon it was for Rat. Very few words were spoken, and the badger kept making angry grunting noises. Even the mole, who'd taken his friend's side as far as possible, couldn't really understand how Toad had managed to outwit the Rat. And so the Rat sat at the table, crestfallen and ashamed, realising that his story was both pitiful and unconvincing. Eventually the Mole spoke. Ratty, I know how you must feel, and I'm sorry, but you've been a bit of a duffer this time. Toad of all animals. He did it awfully well, said the Rat. He did you awfully well, rejoined the Badger. Fancy him talking you into leaving the house, and then he escapes down a sheet. Ugh. Still, talking won't mend matters. He's got clear away by this time, that's for certain. And the worst of it is he'll be so conceited with what he'll think is his cleverness that he may commit any folly. Ha! Huh. One comfort is that we're free now and needn't waste any more of our precious time doing sentry duty. But we'd better continue to sleep at Toad Hall for a while longer. Toad may be brought back at any moment, on a stretcher or between two policemen. So spoke the Badger not knowing what the future held in store, 
or how much water was to run under the bridges before Toad should sit at ease again in his ancestral hall. Meanwhile, Toad, gay and irresponsible, was walking briskly along the high road some miles from home. At first, he'd taken bypaths and crossed many fields and changed his course several times in case of pursuit. But now, feeling safe from recapture, with the sun shining brightly on him, he almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself. Bless my soul, brain against brute force, and brain came out on top as it's bound to do. <laughs> Poor old ratty. My, won't he catch it when the badger gets back. A worthy fellow, Ratty, with many good qualities, but very little intelligence and absolutely no education. I must take him in hand some day and see if I can make something of him. The sign of the Red Lion was swinging across the main street of the small town, and as he approached it, the toad was reminded that he hadn't breakfasted that day and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. So he entered the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at short notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an old familiar sound, approaching down the street, made him start trembling all over. The noise drew nearer and nearer, and then the car could be heard to turn into the yard and come to a stop. What music that sound was in the toad's ears! Then the passengers entered the room, hungry, talkative and gay, voluble on their experience of the morning and the merits of their car that had brought them along so well. Toad could stand it no longer. Leaving the money for his meal on the table, he slipped out of the room and into the courtyard and stood gazing at the magnificent motor car in front of him. There can't be any harm, he said to himself, in my just looking at it. And so he gazed as in a dream. I wonder, I wonder, he thought, if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the engine roared into life, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. He threw himself into the car and his eyes gleamed as he saw before him the mass of switches and controls set in a gleaming wooden dashboard. But by now the party in the inn had heard the engine and were staring in horror from the window and shouting. But the toad heard nothing, nothing save the glorious roar from the engine, and in his mind was the sight of the open road once more, the open road that lay just around the corner. Even as the irate driver raced from the inn to stop him, the toad drove the car from the courtyard. All sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, sat back in style, and the car leapt forth onto the high road. He was toad once more. Toad at his best and highest. Toad the terror. Toad the traffic queller the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the car responded with the steady and powerful drone of its engine. The miles were eaten up under him as he sped he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of just what might come to him. To my mind, observed the judge, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in this dock before us. Now, let me see. Um, he's been found guilty on the clearest evidence, of, first, of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly, of driving to the public danger, and thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences? Oh, without, of course, giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, uh, because there isn't any. The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Uh, some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor car was the worst offence, and, and so it is. Uh, but cheeking the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. 
Um, supposing you were to say uh, 12 months for the theft, mm, which is mild, and three years for the furious driving, oh, which is lenient, and 15 years for the cheek, which was pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box. Even if you only believe one-tenth part of what you've heard, and I never believe more myself, uh, these figures, um, if added together correctly, uh, tot up to uh, 19 years. First rate, said the judge. Uh, so you'd better make it around 20 years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the judge approvingly. A prisoner, uh, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. It's going to be 20 years for you this time. And mind, if you appear before us again, upon any charge whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded him with chains and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting across the marketplace, where the playful populace always as severe upon detected crime as they are sympathetic and helpful when one is merely wanted, assailed him with jeers, carrots and popular catchwords. Past hooting children, their innocent faces lit up with the pleasure they ever derive from the sight of a gentleman in difficulties. Across the hollow sounding drawbridge, <coughs> below the spiky portcullis, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guardrooms full of grinning soldiers off duty, past sentries who coughed in a horrid, sarcastic sort of way. <coughs> because that's as much as a sentry on his post dare do to show his contempt and abhorrence of crime. Up time-worn winding stairs, past men-at-arms in corselets of steel, across courtyards where mastiffs strained at the leash and poured the air to get at him, past ancient warders, dozing over a pasty and a flagon of ale. On, on they went, until they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There, at last, they paused, where an ancient jailer sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. Odd Bodkins, said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. Rouse the old loon and take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt and matchless artfulness and resource. Watch him and ward him with all thy skill. And mark thee well, Greybeard, should aught untoward befall, thy old head shall answer for it. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his weathered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key croaked in the lock. The great door clanged behind them. And Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best guarded keep of the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of Merry England. Willow Wren was twittering his thin little song, hidden away in the dark foliage that came right down to the water's edge. Though it was past ten o'clock at night, the sky still retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed day, and the cool fingers of the short midsummer night broke up and rolled away the sullen heats of the torrid afternoon. Mole lay stretched on the bank, still panting from the stress of the fierce day, and waited for his friend to return. The water rat had been sitting up late with his friend the otter. He hadn't seen him for a while, 
and there was just a chance that he'd have some news of Toad, for the otter moved all over the countryside and met animals from far and near. On his return, Rat went over to the mole. Oh, the blessed coolness of evening, he said, and stood looking thoughtfully down into the river. Any news of Toad? said the mole. Nothing, nothing at all, said the rat. Where he is or what he's doing, I've no idea. No, what's worrying me now is Otter. Oh dear, said the mole, wondering what on earth could be wrong with such a competent animal. Well, what's up, Ratty? Well, it's little Portly, said the rat, referring to the youngest member of the otter's family. He's missing, and been gone for several days. I sat up late with the otter tonight, and I can tell you they're very worried indeed. You see, young Portly can't swim well yet, and they're thinking about the weir. There's a lot of water coming down still, considering the time of year, and the young creature has a fascination about the weir. The two animals strolled towards the rat's house, both deep in thought about the young otter. Why? asked the mole, as they arrived at the front door. Why is Portly so fascinated by the weir? Well, it was there that his father taught him to swim, replied the rat, and he caught his first fish there. Apparently he loves the spot, so Otter goes there every night and sits on that gravel spit near the bank and watches, just on chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking of the same thing. The lonely, heart-sore animal crouched by the ford, watching and waiting the long night through, just on chance. Rat, said the mole suddenly, let's forget about sleep tonight. Let's take the boat out and paddle upstream. The moon will be out soon, and then we can search. It'll be better than just going to bed and waiting. Just what I was thinking myself, said the rat. We'll never sleep in this heat anyway. Let's be off and right away. Out in midstream, there was a clear, narrow track that faintly reflected the sky. But wherever shadows fell on the water, from the bank, bush or tree, they were solid to all appearance as the bank itself. The night was dark, but not deserted. It was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling, telling of the busy little population who were up and about in the heat. And then, as they rode, at last, over the rim of the earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty till it swung clear of the horizon. Now meadows and gardens and the river itself from bank to bank all softly disclosed, washed clean of mystery and terror, and their old haunt smiled at them, awaiting recognition in their shining white apparel. Fastening their boat to a willow, the friends landed in this silver kingdom and patiently explored the hedges the hollow trees, the runnels and their little culverts, the ditches and dry waterways. They worked their way slowly up the river, mooring the boat and searching, then moving upstream again and searching some more. The moon gave what help she could from a cloudless sky, until the hour came when she sank to earth reluctantly and left them. The mole was sculling with gentle strokes, just enough to keep the boat moving, and scanning the banks on either side with care. Dawn was breaking, and the rat suddenly sat up and listened with a passionate intentness. Ah, tis gone, he sighed. So beautiful, so strange, nothing seems worthwhile but to hear that sound once more. I heard nothing, said the mole in wonderment. Nothing but the wind playing on the reeds and the rushes. There it is again, said the rat. That sweet music, that distant piping. The rat was trembling, possessed in all his senses by this new divine thing that caught up his helpless soul. Row on, mole, row on, he cried, for the music and the call must be for us. And the mole rode on, this time in haste, thinking at times that he heard a faint piping, but not sure what it could be, and still wondering what had transformed the rat. 
Now listen, said the rat. So they sat motionless in the boat, close by the bank, where the purple loose strife kissed the surface of the water. Now you will surely hear it. Breathless and transfixed, as the liquid run of that glad piping broke on him, the mole was utterly possessed. He saw tears on his comrade's cheek and bowed his head and understood. And then the clear, intoxicating melody imposed its will on mole. It was clear, imperious, summoning, and mechanically he bent to his oars again. The light grew stronger. But no birds sang as they were wont to at the approach of dawn, and but for the heavenly music, all was marvellous still. Then the murmur of the approaching weir began to hold the air, and they felt they were nearing whatever it might be that was calling them. A wide half-circle of foam and glinting lights and shoulders of green water, the great weir closed the backwater from bank to bank troubled all the quiet surface with swirling eddies and floating foam streaks, and deadened all other sounds with its solemn and soothing rumble. In midmost of the stream, embraced in the weir's shimmering arm spread, a small island lay anchored, fringed close with willow and silver birch. And here, without doubt or hesitation, the two animals moored their boat at the flowery margin of the island. In silence, they pushed their way through blossom and scented herbage and undergrowth that led to the level ground where they stood on a marvellous little lawn set around with nature's own orchard trees, crab apple, wild cherry and sloe. This is the place I saw in my mind, said the rat. The place the music played to me. The pipes have called us here and here we shall surely find him. And then together the animals knelt on the ground, for a great awe fell upon them. They felt at peace and happy, and knew, just knew, that some august presence was near. And then all sounds fell away. Even the mighty weir was no longer to be heard. Slowly, the two friends looked up. They saw dew-fresh sweet grass and looked further. And in the utter clearness of that early dawn, while nature held her breath, they looked into his very eyes. They saw the backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the growing daylight, the stern hooked nose between the kindly eyes that looked down so humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half smile at the corners. They saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest the long, supple hand holding the pan pipes that had so recently called them. They saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs, and last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping in peace and contentment, the little round form of the baby otter. Rat, whispered the mole, are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat. Afraid of him? Oh, never, never. And the two animals, bathed in a glorious light, bowed their heads and did worship. Sudden and magnificent, the sun's golden rays shot across the level water meadows, dazzling the two creatures. And when they were able to look again, the vision had vanished. They could hear the weir once more and the air was filled with the carol of birds that hailed the door. A light breeze sprang up along the surface of the water. It shook the dewy roses. It blew lightly in the faces of the water rat and his friend the mole. And with its soft touch came forgetfulness of all they'd seen and heard. For this is the last gift bestowed by that kindly demigod on those to whom he has revealed himself lest, in remembering him, they should find their pleasure overshadowed. Forgetfulness that they might be happy and light-hearted as before. More than an hour later, in the bright sunshine of early morning, the rat and the mole set off sleepily for home. 
The birds sang, the flowers nodded, and on the far bank the otter, his arm tight around his little son, waved them a joyous and happy farewell. I feel strangely tired, said the rat, with a faraway music playing in my ear. I wonder just what it can be. Yes, I wonder, answered the mole, for I can hear it too, and something else has been puzzling me. On the island where we found Portly, I saw in the ground some hoof marks, as if some great animal had been there. But the weary rat made no reply. He was fast asleep. But what of that other animal missing from the river bank? Mr. Toad. In episode 12, we join him in his dank and dirty dungeon. Was it days, weeks, or perhaps even months? The toad just couldn't remember how long he'd been locked up in the ancient castle. He'd lost all count of time. It was damp and cold in his cell, and the toad's spirits were at their lowest ebb. He was no longer the reckless creature who disported himself with gay abandon along the English high roads in the sunshine and the fresh air. No longer the popular handsome toad, the rich and hospitable toad, the toad so free and careless and debonair. He was indeed a sad creature, and he flung himself upon the floor sobbing. Stupid animal that I was, he cried. For my sins, I must now languish in this dungeon till people who are proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of toad. Oh, wise old badger, Oh, clever, intelligent rat and sensible mole. <laughs> oh, what a sound knowledge of men and matters you possess. <laughs> oh, unhappy and forsaken toad. And so the days and the weeks passed, with toad in this unhappy state. He refused his meals, he spoke not a word to his jailers, and his condition grew worse and worse. Now the head jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. And she was particularly fond of animals. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of the toad, spoke to her father of his plight, and asked that she might manage him, feed him up, and altogether make his life more agreeable. And her father, who was tired of toad and his sulks and airs, was really quite relieved that his daughter should want to look after such an unpleasant prisoner. So one day she went to Toad's cell on her errand of mercy, with a special meal she'd cooked for him. It was bubble and squeak, hot from the oven, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. But the Toad, lying prostrate on the floor, ignored her. He made no movement, no sound, he lay as in a trance. But being a thoughtful girl, and knowing the ways of animals, the jailer's daughter departed from the cell, leaving the food just in front of the toad's nose, in the hope that its delightful aroma might arouse him from his stupor. The penetrating smell of the cabbage assailed toad's nostrils. It was the first time inside this awful prison that a hot meal had been placed before him, and it was the first time that he'd been honoured by a visit from the jailer's daughter. And he realised that for one reason or another, he was getting some special attention. And quite frankly, he was rather flattered. He quietly got to his feet, tiptoed to the door and peered through the narrow barred window. 
When he was quite sure that no one was around and likely to look in on him, he rushed back to the food and bolted it down with relish. Ah, how delicious it was. It brought new life back to him, and he reflected that perhaps things were not as blank and desperate as he'd imagined. New and inspiring thoughts came to him of chivalry and poetry and deeds still to be done, of broad meadows and cattle browsing in them, and the air of the narrow cell took on a rosy tinge. He thought of his friends and how they might be able to help him, and then of lawyers and how they would have enjoyed his case, and what an ass he'd been not to get in a few. And lastly, he thought of his own great cleverness and resource, and all that he was capable of, if only he gave his mind to it. And the cure was complete. He was Mr. Toad once more. When the girl returned some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of steaming tea on it and a plate piled up with hot buttered toast, with the butter running off it, great golden drops like honey from a honeycomb. The toad no longer ignored her. He sat up when she entered, and he munched his toast and sipped his tea, and soon began talking freely about himself and his house, and how important he was, and what a lot his friends thought of him. He spoke of the fish pond and the old walled garden, the pigsties and the stables and the pigeon house, of the dairy, the hen house and the wash house, of the china cupboards and the linen presses. The jailer's daughter liked that bit especially. And as he talked, he munched more toast and he sipped more tea. And it was just as if he were back at Toad Hall, entertaining a gracious lady. He mentioned the banqueting hall and the fun they had there when the other animals were gathered around the table and how he, Toad, would sing songs and tell stories and carry on generally. And oh, what a wonderful life it was to be Toad of Toad Hall. And then as he paused for breath, he looked around and realised how his own words had carried him away. For he was still a prisoner, still the occupant of this dark damp cell. And seeing him sadden a little, the jailer's daughter shook up his straw, filled his jug with fresh water, and quietly left the now tired toad to sleep and to dream. From that time on they had many interesting talks, and the jailer's daughter began to feel very sorry for toad. She thought it a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her such a trivial offence. So one morning she entered the toad's cell, shut the door behind her and quietly said, Toad, listen please, but I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. Oh, there, there, said the toad graciously and affably. Oh, never mind, think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Oh, do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. You talk too much, that's your trouble. Now, as I said, I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. She takes the washing out Monday morning and brings it back Friday evening. Now, today's Thursday, and what occurs to me is that you're rich. At least you're always telling me so. And she's very poor. A few pounds won't make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. So if you approached her properly... You could come to some arrangement oh, by which she'd let you have her dress and bonnet and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're like in many respects, particularly about the figure. We are not, said the toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure oh, for what I am. So is my aunt, replied the girl, for what she is. Oh, but look here said Toad. Surely you wouldn't have a Mr. Toad of Toad Hall going around the country disguised as a washerwoman? Then you can stop here as a toad, said the girl with much spirit. I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four. Honest Toad was always ready to admit himself in the wrong. You're a good, kind, clever girl, he said, and I am indeed proud and stupid. Introduce me to your worthy aunt, if you'll be so kind, and I've no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. Next evening, the girl ushered her aunt 
into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing pinned up in a towel. And the sight of certain gold sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table completed the matter there and then. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl and a rusty black bonnet. The only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped in a corner. This, she explained, would help her to retain her situation in spite of the suspicious appearance of things. And then the jailer's daughter helped Toad into his disguise. She shook with laughter as she dressed him up as the washerwoman and found that he was so plump that his jacket and waistcoat had to come off before anything else would fit. At last she tied the strings of the bonnet under his chin and said, Toad, why, you're the very image of her. So now goodbye and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, which they probably will, remember you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart, about as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and hazardous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that he could not claim the credit for this new popularity. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. Even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea and telling him to hurry up. The various remarks to which he was subjected formed his chief danger, for Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity. Hello, sweetheart! And the remarks, he thought, were mostly poor and clumsy and entirely lacking in humour. <laughs> However, he kept his temper and, with difficulty, suited his replies to his supposed character and did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, rejected the pressing invitations from the last guardroom and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. He was now but a few steps from the busy world. He could see ahead the people of the town meeting and talking as they did every evening. But to Toad, it was all new and exciting. It was life again after so many dreary days in his dank, depressing dungeon. He felt he wanted to run, to flee this dreadful castle as fast as he could, and as he did so, to shout rude words at the warders. But this he knew he must not do. No, he must remain a washerwoman for some time yet, until it was safe for him to reassume his real identity. And so Toad took that final step that carried him outside the prison walls. The great wooden door shut fast behind him, and he stood still for a moment. He felt the fresh air upon his brow and knew that he was free. The great wooden doors that stretched high into the castle battlements were shut fast. The ancient fortress, grim and forbidding in the evening light, was locked and secure. And Toad, dizzy with the success of his daring escape from such a prison, was walking quickly towards the lights of the town. Not knowing in the least what he should do next, he was only certain of one thing, 
that he must remove himself as quickly as possible from a neighbourhood where the lady he was forced to represent was so well known and so popular a character. As he walked along, considering, his attention was caught by a distant sound. The puffing and snorting of engines and the banging of shunted trucks. Ha ha, he thought. This is a piece of luck, a railway station, the one thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. And what's more, I needn't go through the town to get to it, and I shan't have to support this humiliating character by repartees which, though thoroughly effective, do not assist one's sense of self-respect. He made his way to the station accordingly, consulted a timetable, and found that a train bound more or less in the direction of his home was due to start in half an hour. More luck, said the toad, his spirits rising rapidly, and he went off to the booking office to buy a ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to Toad Hall, and mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money in his waistcoat pocket. But here the cotton gown which had nobly stood by him so far intervened and frustrated his efforts. He just couldn't get through it. The other travellers waited with impatience. They had tickets to buy, trains to catch, luggage to collect, and aunts and uncles to say goodbye to. And here was this stupid old washerwoman holding them all up. At last he got through the gown, and then... Horror! Not only no money, but no pocket, not even a waistcoat. And then he remembered that he'd left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell, and with them his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case, all that makes life worth living. In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off. Becoming Mr. Toad once more, he said, uh, Oh, look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Oh, just give me that ticket, will you? Uh, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him for a moment and then laughingly said, <laughs> I should think you were pretty well known in these parts if you've tried this game on often. Now, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. Baffled and full of despair, Toad wandered blindly down the platform with tears trickling down each side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost of home, and to be balked by the want of a few wretched shillings, and by the mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered, he thought. He'd be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison, and bread, and water, and straw. His guards and penalties would be doubled, and oh, what sarcastic remarks the girl would make. What was to be done? Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage, he thought. He'd seen this done often by schoolboys, who'd found a better use for their ticket money. And as he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Well, hello, mother, said the driver. And what's your trouble? You don't look very cheerful. Oh, sir, cried Toad. I am a poor and unhappy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money, and can't pay for a ticket, and I must get home tonight somehow. The children will be hungry and upsetting and breaking things, and oh dear, oh dear. Well, bless my soul, we can't have that, can we? said the kindly engine driver. I'll tell you what, you're a washerwoman and I'm an engine driver, as you may well see, and there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. You wash me a few shirts and send them on when you get home, and though it's against regulations, I'll give you a ride on my engine. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he'd never washed a shirt in his life and had no intention of beginning now, but he thought, when I get safely home and have money again, I'll make it up to the engine driver. The guard waved his flag, the engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. 
As the speed increased, the toad could see on either side of him real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him. And he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall and sympathetic friends and a soft bed to sleep in and good things to eat and praise and admiration at the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness. And then he began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song to the great astonishment of the engine driver, who'd come across washerwomen before, but never one at all like this. By the time it was dark, they'd covered many and many a mile, and the train raced through moonlit countryside. And then Toad noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. That's very strange, he said to Toad. We're the last train running in this direction tonight, and yet I swear there's another one following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He sank slowly down onto the floor, grave and depressed, trying desperately not to think of the awful possibilities. I can see it clearly now, the engine driver called out. It is an engine on our rails and coming along at a great pace. And it's crowded with the queerest lot of people I ever did see. Indeed, it was a most amazing sight. A single engine pouring forth smoke and steam and clinging to it all manner of men caught up in the chase. Ancient warders waving cudgels, policemen in their helmets waving truncheons. Shabbily dressed men, unmistakably detectives in their pot hats, waving revolvers and walking sticks, and all of them shouting the same thing. Stop! 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 The toad, now kneeling, raised his paws in supplication. Save me! Oh, save me, dear, kind Mr. Engine Driver, and I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad. I have just escaped, by great daring and cleverness, from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if I am recaptured, then chains, bread and water and misery for me once more. Oh, unhappy and innocent Toad. The engine driver looked down on him very sternly and said, Now then, tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? Oh, it was... Nothing very much, said poor Toad, colouring deeply. I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. But people, especially judges, take such harsh views of thoughtlessness and high-spirited action. The engine driver looked grave and said, I fear that you have indeed been a wicked Toad, and by rights I ought to give you up. But you're obviously in trouble and distress, so I won't desert you. I don't hold with motor cars for one thing, and I don't hold for being ordered about by a policeman when I'm on my own engine for another. And the sight of an animal in tears always makes me soft-hearted. So cheer up, Toad, we may beat them yet. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, and the engine leapt and swung but still their pursuers slowly gained. I'm afraid it's no good, Toad, said the engine driver as the train ran into a long tunnel. There's just one thing left for us to do, and it's your only chance, so listen carefully. On the other side of the tunnel is a thick wood. Now, we are going flat out, but the others are bound to slow down a bit in the tunnel for fear of an accident. So when we're through, I'll shut off steam and brake as hard as I can, and you must leap for the safety of the woods. Then I'll go off again, and they can chase me if they like, for as long as they like. Now, be ready. They piled on more coals as the engine rushed and roared and rattled through the darkness, till at last they shot out at the other end into the moonlight and saw the wood lying dark and helpful on either side of the line. The driver shut off steam, slammed on the brakes, and when the train was almost at a walking pace, he called out, Jump! Toad rolled and twisted and bumped and fell all the way down the steep embankment. He collided with hillocks, knocked over bushes and scared the local residents right out of their tiny wits. 
At last, he reached the bottom and dived into the wood. By this time, his train had disappeared into the night, but suddenly, out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling, her motley crew waving their various weapons and shouting, Stop! Stop! And seeing this incredible sight, the toad, for the first time since he was thrown into prison, laughed. He laughed and laughed and laughed, till the tears were streaming down his cheeks and his sides ached. And then he stopped laughing. In fact, not only did he stop, but he wondered why he'd even started laughing in the first place. For here he was in an unknown wood. It was very late and dark and cold, and he was without money, supper or friends. He found the silent wood strange and unfriendly. An owl swooped noiselessly towards him, brushing his shoulder and making him jump. So he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, and, tired, hungry and humiliated, made himself as comfortable as possible, and went to sleep. There is no doubt that soft earth and a warm covering of leaves do make a far more comfortable bed than the straw and cold stone floor of a prison cell. And that was why the toad slept so well that night in the hollow of the old tree. What woke him was partly the bright sunlight streaming in on him and partly the exceeding coldness of his toes which was not surprising, since the size of the hollow dictated that one end of Toad had to protrude outside the tree, and he'd reasoned that if something had to be chilled, then better his toes than his head. He sat up, rubbing his eyes first and his complaining toes next, and wondered for a moment where he was. He looked for the familiar stone wall and little barred window of his prison, and then his heart leapt as he remembered everything that had happened the previous day, and that above all, he was free. Free! The thought and the word alone were worth fifty blankets. He was warm from end to end as he leapt into the jolly world outside the hollow. The morning sun flooded the wood, dispelling all the nervous terrors of yesterday, and Toad set off on his way in the happiest of spirits. He had all the world to himself that early summer morning. But the woods and fields, even the road itself when he reached it, seemed lonely. And Toad needed desperately to find someone who'd say which way that lonely road was pointing. Not knowing which direction, if any, led to safety, the Toad decided to head for a small canal a short distance ahead. It ambled along side by side with the road for many a mile. But, like the road, the canal was also unwilling to talk to strangers about its destination. Then, round the bend came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward in anxious thought. From rope traces attached to his collar stretched a long line that led, dripping, down into the water. Toad let the horse pass and stood waiting for what the fates were sending him. With a pleasant swirl of quiet water at its blunt bow, the barge slid up alongside of him, its gaily painted gunnel level with the towing path. Its sole occupant, a big, stout woman, wearing a linen sunbonnet, one brawny arm laying along the tiller. A nice morning, ma'am, she remarked to Toad as she drew level with him. I dare say it is, responded Toad politely, as he walked along the towpath abreast of her. I dare say it is a nice morning to them that's not in sore trouble as I am. 
but here's me married daughter sends off to me to come post haste. So I come at once, fearing the worst, and I've left my washing business and the kids to look after themselves. And on top of that, I've lost my money in my way, and I dread to think what's happened to my daughter. Well, where might your married daughter be living, ma'am? Asked the barge woman. She lives close to a fine house called Toad Hall, which is on the river somewhere in these parts of Toad Hall. Why, I'm going that way myself, replied the barge woman. This canal joins the river not far from Toad Hall. You come along with me. I'll give you a lift. Soon they were gliding down the little canal. Toad perched on the side of the barge, in a manner most unbecoming, even to a washerwoman. Ha! Ah, toad's luck again. Thought he, I always come out on top. So you're in the washing business, ma'am," said the barge woman, "and a very good business you've got, no doubt. Finest business in the whole country," said Toad airily. "All the gentry come to me; wouldn't go to anyone else if they were paid. They know me so well. You see, I personally supervise all that's done on the premises: washing, ironing, starching, making up gents' fine shirts for evening wear." Everything's done under my own eyes. Are you fond of washing? Asked the barge woman thoughtfully. I love it," said Toad. "I simply dote on it. Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash tub. What a regular piece of good fortune for both of us then that we met!" exclaimed the barge woman. "Oh, well, why do you say that?" Asked the toad nervously. "Well, look at me," replied the barge woman. "I like washing too, like yourself, and I have to do my own moving about as I do. But my husband, why, right now he should be attending the barge, but he's gone off with a dog to see if they can pick up a rabbit for supper. So how am I to get on with the washing? Oh, never mind about the washing," said Toad, not liking the subject at all. "Try and fix your mind on that rabbit. A nice fat one, I'll be bound." Got any onions? I can't fix my mind on anything but my washing," said the barge woman. "Look, there's a heap of things in my cabin, and as you love washing, if you'll just take one or two of the most necessary, I won't venture to describe them to a lady like you. But you'll recognise them and put them through the wash tub as we go along. It'll be a real help to me. You'll find everything you want below." Toad was now fairly cornered. He looked for escape this way and that. Saw that he was too far from the bank for a flying leap, and sullenly resigned himself to his fate. If it comes to that, he thought in desperation. I suppose any fool can wash. And so Toad stood before the wash tub, in one hand the necessaries selected at random from the barge woman's cabin, in the other a large bar of soap. And as he stood, he desperately tried to recollect what he'd seen in casual glances through laundry windows. A long half hour passed, and every minute of it saw Toad getting crosser and crosser. Nothing that he could do to the garments seemed to please them or do them good. He tried coaxing, he tried slapping, he tried punching, but they smiled back at him out of the tub, as happy and unwashed as ever. Once or twice, he looked nervously over his shoulder at the barge woman, but she appeared to be gazing out in front of her, absorbed in her steering. His back ached badly, and he noticed with dismay that his paws were beginning to get all crinkly. Now Toad was very proud of his paws. He muttered under his breath words that should never pass the lips of either washerwomen or Toads, and lost the soap for the fiftieth time. And even as he was muttering, a large, strong hand fell on his shoulder. "Well, well, well," said the barge woman. "I've been watching you all the time. I thought you must be unbug all along from the conceited way you talked. Pretty washerwoman you are. Never washed even a dishcloth in your old life, I'll lay." Toad's temper, which had been simmering viciously for some time, now fairly boiled over, and he lost all control of himself. "You common low fat barge woman!" he shouted. "Washerwoman indeed! I would have you know that I am a toad, 
a very well-known, respected and distinguished toad. I may be under a bit of a cloud at present, but I will not be laughed at by a barge woman. The woman moved nearer to him and peered under his bonnet. Well, I never, she cried. You are a toad, a horrid, nasty, crawly toad, and in my nice clean barge too. Now that's one thing I will not have. One big brawny arm shot out and caught Toad by a foreleg, while the other gripped him fast by a hind leg. Going to see a married daughter, indeed. Left the children to look after themselves, have you? Ha! I'll give you poor old washerwoman. Poor Toad. He was now quite speechless with rage as the bargewoman carried him on to the deck and hurled him over the side. The world turned suddenly upside down. He saw a blur of barge and water, of trees and grass, and he saw the astonished look on the faces of two cows by the water's edge, who never, in their long contented lives, had seen such an incredible sight. The water, when he eventually reached it, proved quite cold enough for his taste, though its chill was not sufficient to quell his proud spirit or slake the heat of his fiery temper. He rose to the surface, spluttering, and when he'd wiped the duckweed out of his eyes, the first thing he saw was the fat bargewoman looking back at him over the stern of the retreating barge and laughing. It took Toad a very long time to get to the shore, for the cotton gown greatly impeded his efforts and was immensely tiring. But when he'd regained some of his strength, he gathered his wet skirt well over his arms and ran after the barge as fast as his legs would carry him. He was wild with indignation and thirsting for revenge. The barge woman was still laughing when he drew level with her. Put yourself through a mango washer, woman, she called out, and iron your face and you'll pass for quite a decent looking toad. Toad never paused for a reply. He saw what he wanted ahead of him. Running swiftly on, he overtook the horse, unfastened the tow rope and cast off. The barge woman's laughter turned to rage as she saw Toad jump onto the horse's back and urge it to a gallop in the direction of the open country. The wind whistled around him as he sped on. And at last, feeling that both he and the horse could do with a breather, he pulled his steed to a halt on a small hillock, and he looked back over the way he'd come. There in the distance he could see the small canal, and then he chuckled to himself. For the barge was also visible. It was hard aground on the bank, and on top he could see a small figure leaping up and down in fury. And Toad's chuckle became a laugh, a mighty laugh, a laugh infectious enough to humour even a horse. And so the horse laughed with him, but it was a long time since he had heard or seen anything funny. They sat on the hill and laughed. They laughed and laughed and laughed. Perhaps Toad would not have laughed so heartily had he known that ahead of him lay more hair-raising adventures and an unexpected meeting with an old friend. Never in his whole life had Toad laughed so much as at the sight of the canal barge stuck fast and the barge woman jumping up and down in fury. Well, serve her right, he said to himself, thinking of how she'd thrown him into the water. And he looked over at the horse, who was spread-eagled on the ground, for he too had found it very funny and seemed not at all bothered about getting back to his dreary job of pulling the barge along the towpath, which was after all, 
understandable. At long last, both creatures staggered to their feet and set off at a very slow pace across the country. They'd travelled some miles and were feeling drowsy in the warm sunshine when they came to a wide common. Nearby was a dingy gypsy caravan and beside it a man was sitting on a bucket. He was busy, smoking and staring into the wide world. A fire of sticks was burning nearby and over the fire hung an iron pot from which came forth bubblings and gurglings and a vague suggestive steaminess. Also smells, warm, rich and varied smells that twined and twisted and wreathed themselves at last into one complete voluptuous and perfect smell. Now Toad was very, very hungry. He looked the gypsy over carefully and the gypsy puffed on his pipe and looked at Toad. The gypsy spoke first. Want to sell that horse of yours? he said. What? cried Toad. Me sell this beautiful horse? Who take the washing to my customers every week? And, and anyway, I'm very fond of him. Oh, no, I'd never sell him. But all the same, just out of interest, of course, how much would you offer me? The gypsy looked the horse over, then looked Toad over with equal care. A shilling a leg, he said briefly, and went on smoking his pipe. A shilling a leg, said Toad indignantly. Oh, well, uh, just, just wait a minute, I'll, I'll have to work that out. Toad climbed down off the horse and sat beside the fire. He did vast sums and calculations on his arms and his legs and muttered figures to himself and at last said, A shilling a leg? Uh, why, that comes to exactly four shillings. Why, I wouldn't accept a paltry four shillings for such a horse. Well then, said the gypsy, I'll make it five shillings, and that's me last word. Toad pondered for a while, for he was hungry and quite penniless. Oh, look here, gypsy, he said at last. Uh, and this is my last word, six and sixpence in cash and as much breakfast as I can eat at one sitting, and you can have horse, harness and all. The gypsy grumbled frightfully about how such deals would lead to his ruination as he carefully counted out six shillings and sixpence from a dirty canvas bag and placed them on Toad's outstretched paw. Then he went over to the fire and poured from the iron pot a glorious stream of hot, rich stew. It was indeed the most beautiful stew in the world, being made of partridges and pheasants and chickens and hares and rabbits and peahens and guinea fowls and one or two other things. Toad took the plate on his lap, almost crying, and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed. He thought he'd never eaten so good a breakfast in all his life. An hour later, on his travels once more, he was a very different toad. And as he walked, he wondered at his ability always to find a way out of trouble. And his pride and conceit began to swell within him. Ho, 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 what a clever toad I am. Surely I have no equal. My enemies lock me up and I escape by sheer ability oh, coupled with courage. They chase me and I elude them. I'm thrown into a canal by an evil woman, but I ride off in triumph on her horse. And so puffed up did he become that he made up a poem about himself, which he recited at the top of his voice. It was the most conceited poem you ever heard. The world has held great heroes, as history books have showed, but never a name to go down to fame compared to that of Toad. The army all saluted as they marched along the road. Was it the King or Kitchener? No, it was Mr. Toad. The Queen and her ladies-in-waiting sat at the window and sewed. She cried, look, who's that handsome man? They answered, Mr. Toad. There were many more such verses, but far too dreadful to be repeated. Those were some of the milder ones. 
After many miles of country lanes, he eventually reached the high road. And as he looked down the length of it, he saw a speck in the distance. A speck that turned into a blob, a blob that turned into something very familiar, as was the sound that fell upon his ears. This is something like said the excited toad. I will hail my brothers at the wheel, pitch them a bit of a yarn, and they'll give me a lift. Might even be driven up to Toad Hall. <laughs> That'll be one in the eye for Badger. But then, as he stood at the roadside, he turned pale. His heart turned to water. His knees shook, and he collapsed on the ground. And well he might, for the approaching car was the very one he'd stolen from the inn yard on that fatal day when all his troubles began. And the passengers were the very same people who'd seen him steal it. He sank down onto the road, a shabby, miserable, despairing heap. The terrible motor car stopped just short of him. He heard footsteps coming towards him, and then a voice said, Oh dear, how sad, this poor old washerwoman seems to have fainted in the road. Probably overcome by the heat or perhaps lack of food. Let's take her to the nearest village where she doubtless has friends. And very soon Toad, in luck yet again, was resting on soft cushions as the car proceeded along the high road. And slowly his courage began to revive. Oh, the fresh air's obviously doing her good, said one of the gentlemen. She's better already. Oh, thank you kindly, sir, said Toad, in a feeble voice. Yes, I'm feeling a lot better, and I was thinking, might I sit there on the front seat beside the driver? The fresh air full in my face will soon make me right again. How very sensible, said the gentleman. Oh, of course you may sit here. So Toad was helped into the front seat beside the driver. And then he felt the old tremors and yearnings and cravings rise within him. Ah, it's fate, he said to himself. So why strive? Why struggle? He turned to the driver at his side and asked, oh, Please, sir, I've been watching you carefully, and the driving appears to be so easy and interesting. And I'd love to tell my friends that once I drove a motor car and... Bravo, ma'am! said the driver. I like your spirit. Yes, you have a try. And so the car stopped, and Toad was allowed to take the driver's seat and patiently listened to all the instructions he was given, until at last, slowly and carefully, he set the car in motion. From the back of the car, Toad heard the gentleman comment on his driving. How well she does it! And it's the first time. Now, who'd have thought it from a washerwoman of all people? And that did it. Washerwoman? Thought Toad. I'll show them. The car leapt down the road. The passengers were thrown back in the seats, and Toad drove on at full speed. Washerwoman indeed! He shouted breathlessly. Ho, ho, ho! I am the Toad, the motor car snatcher, the prison breaker, the Toad who always escapes. Sit still, and in my hands you shall know what driving really is. Recognising him now, the whole party flung themselves upon Toad. Seize him, they cried. Bind him, chain him, drag him to the nearest police station. Down with the desperate and dangerous Toad. Alas, they should have remembered to stop the motor car before taking such drastic action. With a half turn of the wheel, Toad sent the motor car crashing through the low hedge that ran alongside the road. One mighty bound, a violent shock, and the car was in the middle of a duck pond. Toad, for the second time that day, found himself flying. It seemed to go on forever, and he was wondering if he'd developed wings and turned into a toad bird, when, with a thump, he landed in the soft, rich grass of a meadow. There was no time to collect his wits or his breath, for he could see already the angry figures emerging from the pond and making in his direction. And so he ran as fast as he could across the countryside. He slipped and he fell and he tripped. He became caught in brambles and slowly but surely his pursuers gained ground. He struggled on blindly and wildly 
And then the earth failed under his feet and he vainly grasped at the air and then... He found himself head over ears in deep water. Rapid water, water that bore him along with a force he could not contend with. Oh my! gasped poor Toad. If I ever steal another motor car again! And then he saw a branch above his head. He grabbed it and held on and slowly regained his breath. And as he hung, suspended in the water, he noticed a dark hole beside him in the bank. And something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it. And then around it appeared a face. A brown little face with whiskers, with neat ears and silky hair. It was the water rat. So at last, Toad had arrived back on the river bank. But he'd yet to hear what had happened in his absence, and above all, of the terrible goings-on at Toad Hall. The rat gripped the toad firmly by the scruff of the neck and pulled and pulled and pulled. Inch by inch, the waterlogged toad was hoisted over the edge of the hole. He was exhausted and numb with cold, but so relieved that he was back on the river bank. He stood in the hall, streaked with mud and weed, with the water streaming off him. Oh, ratty! he cried. I've been through such time since I last saw you. You can't think of such trials, such sufferings, and all so nobly born. I've been in prison, and out of it, of course, been thrown in a canal, stole a horse, which I sold for a small fortune, humbugged everybody, and made them do just what I wanted. Toad, said the water rat, go upstairs at once. Take off those old cotton rags and clean yourself thoroughly. Then put on some of my clothes and try and come down looking like a gentleman, if you can. Now stop swaggering and be off. I've something to say to you later. And catching a glimpse of himself in the mirror, Toad realised just what a sight he was. He humbly set off up the stairs to change. By the time he came down again, luncheon was on the table. Both the animals tucked in, and between mouthfuls, Toad told of all his adventures, and the rat listened patiently. When, at last, the Toad had finished both food and story, there was silence for a while. Then the rat spoke. Toady, I don't want to upset your feelings after all you've been through, but seriously, don't you see what an awful ass you've been making of yourself? On your own admission, you've been handcuffed, imprisoned, starved, chased, terrified out of your life, and insulted. Now, where's the fun in all that? All because you had to go and steal a motor car. Why don't you try and be sensible for a change? Do you think it's any pleasure to me, for instance, to hear other animals saying that I'm the chap that keeps company with jailbirds? The toad was silent for a minute. Then he looked the rat straight in the eye. Ratty, I, I'm sorry, he said. You're, you're quite right, you always are. No, I will change for the better, I promise you. Now, why don't we have a stroll along the river bank and have a quiet chat? Then I'll go on to Toad Hall and set things going again on the old lines. The toad was already outside the door when the rat called out, Did you say stroll gently down to Toad Hall? Do you mean to say that you haven't heard, Toad? Heard what? said Toad, turning in his tracks. What haven't I heard? 
The stoats and the weasels, cried Rat. They've taken Toad Hall. What? cried the Toad. The, the wild wooders? Oh, you can't mean it, Rat. Taken Toad Hall? But the Rat did mean it. And walking Toad along the river bank, he explained what had happened. When the news came through that he'd gone to prison for stealing a car, it became the scandal of the whole area, including the wild wood. And the rat told of how the river folk had stood up for Toad and claimed there was no justice in the land and that he should be released immediately, while the wild wooders said hard and vicious things like, it serves him right, and he's done for this time, and he'll never get out of prison ever. That's the sort of beasts they are, said the rat. But Mole and Badger, they stuck out that you'd be back, and soon. They didn't know how, but somehow. And then, the most painful part of the story. Apparently, Mole and Badger moved into Toad Hall to keep it ready for its owner's return. But one dark night, a very dark night, and blowing hard with the rain pouring down, a band of weasels, armed to the teeth, crept silently up the carriage drive to the front entrance. Simultaneously, a body of desperate ferrets, advancing through the kitchen garden, took the backyard and offices, while a company of skirmishing stoats, who stuck at nothing, occupied the conservatory and billiard room, and held the French windows opening onto the lawn. The mole and the badger were quite unsuspecting when those bloodthirsty villains broke down the doors and rushed in on them from every side. They fought as best they could. But what were two against 200? They were beaten severely with sticks and turned out into the cold and the wet. And the wild wooders have been living in the hall ever since, continued the rat. The place is in a filthy mess, and they're telling everyone that they're staying for good. Oh, are they? said Toad, getting up and seizing a stick. I'll soon see about that. And despite all the rat could do, he was off. He marched rapidly in the direction of Toad Hall, muttering to himself in his anger, and determined to show the wild wooders that not only was Toad back, but that he'd take possession again of his home there and then. He strode up to the imposing front gates of the hall, when suddenly there popped up from behind the palings a long yellow ferret with a gun. Who goes there? said the ferret sharply. Oh, stuff and nonsense, said Toad very angrily. What do you mean talking like that to me? Come out of it at once or I'll... The Toad fled for his life, as not just one but several bullets whistled over his head, and he could hear the ferret laugh, and then others joining in. Crestfallen, he rejoined the water rat and told him what had happened. I tried to stop you, said the rat. It's no good. They've got sentries posted. They're all armed. You must just wait. But Toad was not inclined to give in all at once. He got out Rat's boat and set off up the river to where the garden of Toad Hall came down to the waterside. Arriving within sight of his old home, he rested on his oars and surveyed the land cautiously. He could see the whole front of Toad Hall glowing in the evening sunshine. The pigeons settling by twos and threes along the line of the roof. The garden a blaze of flowers. All seemed tranquil and apparently waiting for his return. He'd try the boathouse first, he thought. So very warily he paddled up to the mouth of the creek and was just passing under the bridge when the great stone completely smashed the boat and Toad found himself struggling in deep water. Above him, two stoats were leaning on the parapet and watching with great glee. It'll be your head next time, Toady, they called out to him. And the Toad spluttered and fumed and fumed and spluttered. It was quite late that same evening. The toad was silent and depressed. He'd ruined the rat's suit, cost him a good boat, and it seemed that he'd never live at Toad Hall again. Oh, cheer up, Toady, said the rat. 
Wait till we've seen Mole and Badger and heard their latest news. Good heavens! cried Toad, brightening up. Mole and Badger! Quite forgotten them! What's become of the dear fellows? Well, may you ask, said the Rat reproachfully. While you've been cavorting all over the countryside, those two poor devoted animals have been living very rough by day and lying very hard by night watching over your house. Their only thought has been to get back for you your property. You don't deserve such friends. At that moment, there was a heavy knock on the door. The toad, after his experiences that afternoon, was nervous, but the rat walked over and lifted the catch. And who should walk in but Mr. Badger? His shoes were covered in mud, and he looked rough and dishevelled. He had all the appearance of someone who hadn't been home for a very long time. He shook Toad by the paw. Welcome home, Toad, he said. Oh, but what am I saying? This is a poor homecoming indeed. Unhappy Toad. Then, turning his back on both the animals, he sat down at the table and helped himself to a large slice of ham. Toad looked very worried at this short and serious greeting, but the rat whispered, Never mind, he's always like that when he's in need of food. Wait till he's eaten, he'll be quite a different animal. And then another knock at the door, a lighter knock. This time Toad opened it. And there stood the mole. Hooray, he cried. Here's old Toad. Fancy having you back again. The mole, shabby and unwashed, had forgotten his own discomfort at once. Never dreamt you'd turn up so soon, Toad, he said. Now we can really plan to outwit the wild wooders. And sitting around the table, they got down to the subject of recapturing Toad Hall. And how they went on. They planned and schemed agreed and disagreed, laughed and argued, and got precisely nowhere. I think we should... No, we shouldn't, shouted the Toad. What we ought... Don't be so daft, Toady, said the Rat. Well, it was a better suggestion than yours, said the Mole. All you've done is... <coughs> the Badger looked sternly down at them. Now just listen to me, he said. If we're to be at all successful in this venture, we must remain cool, calm and collected. Now gather round me. And so they gathered round the badger, and he told them a secret plan. It was so secret that he spoke in a whisper. It was daring, it was outrageous, it was dangerous, and it was also very, very exciting. In the next episode of The Wind in the Willows, Badger and Mole Toad and Ratty make preparations to put the secret plan into operation, knowing that they face tremendous odds and that the battle will be fierce and bloody. The badger was telling his secret plan. He spoke in a whisper, and the animals gathered close around him. Toad was quivering with excitement. You see, secrets had an immense attraction for him because he could never keep one, and he loved the thrill of telling others. There is, said the badger, an underground passage that leads from the river bank quite near here right into the middle of Toad Hall. Oh, nonsense, Badger, said the Toad. You've been listening to some old yarn. I know every inch of the hall. There's nothing of the sort, I assure you. 
Now look here, young fellow, said the badger with great severity. Your father, who was a particular friend of mine, discovered that passage which is hundreds of years old and showed it to me, thinking that one day it might be useful. But he said you couldn't hold your tongue and asked me not to tell you unless one day you were in sore trouble and really needed it. Oh, well, said Toad. Perhaps I am a bit of a talker. My friends get round me. We sparkle. We tell witty stories. And somehow my tongue gets wagging. <laughs> but go on, dear Badger. How's this passage of yours going to help us? Well, I've found out a thing or two lately, continued the Badger. I got Otter to disguise himself as a sweep and call at the hall asking for a job. He found out there's going to be a big banquet tomorrow night. It's somebody's birthday, the Chief Weasels, I believe, and they'll be unarmed and suspecting nothing. But the Sentinels will be posted as usual, remarked the Rat. Exactly, said the Badger. That is my point. The Weasels will trust entirely to their excellent Sentinels, who won't see or hear us, for the passage leads right up under the butler's pantry, next to the dining room. We shall creep out quietly into the butler's pantry, cried the Mole. With our pistols and swords and sticks, shouted the Rat. Rush in upon them, said the Badger. And whack em and whack em and whack em, cried the Toad, leaping into the air. Very well, then, said the Badger. Our plan is settled. I suggest now that we all retire to bed. We can make all the necessary arrangements tomorrow morning. The Toad slept to a very late hour next morning, and by the time he got down, he found that the other animals had finished their breakfast some time before. The Mole had slipped off somewhere by himself without telling anyone where he was going. The Badger sat in the armchair reading the paper and not concerning himself in the slightest about what was going to happen that very evening. The Rat, on the other hand, was running around the room, his arms full of weapons of every kind. He was piling them in four little heaps on the floor and saying excitedly under his breath as he ran, Here's a sword for the Rat, here's a sword for the Mole, here's a sword for the Toad, here's a sword for the Badger. A pistol for the rat, a pistol for mole, a pistol for toad, a pistol for badger. And so on in a regular rhythmical way, while the four little heaps gradually grew and grew. That's all very well, rat, said the badger. But just let us once get past the stoats with those detestable guns of theirs. And I assure you, all we'll need is sticks. The four of us will clear the four of them in five minutes. It's as well to be on the safe side, said the rat, and he went on distributing the weapons. The toad, having finished breakfast, was rehearsing for the night attack. I'll learn em to steal my house. I'll learn em, he cried. Don't say learn em, toad, said the rat. It's not good English. It ought to be teach em, not learn em. We don't want to teach em, said the badger. We want to learn them, learn them good and hard, and what's more, we're going to. Then the mole came tumbling into the room and very pleased with himself too. I've been having such fun, he said. I've been annoying the stoats. I hope you've been careful, mole, said the rat anxiously. Well, I got the idea early this morning, said the mole. I found that old washerwoman's dress in the kitchen, so I put it on and went off to Toad Hall as bold as you please. The sentries were on the lookout, of course, with their guns, and their, who goes there, and all the rest of their nonsense. Good morning, gentlemen, says I, very respectful. Want any washing done today? And of course the sergeant told me to run away and not bother his troops. Run away, says I. It won't be me that's running in a very short time from now. You see, my daughter washes for Mr. Badger, and what she told me, you'll find out pretty soon. This very night, a hundred bloodthirsty badgers armed with rifles are going to attack Toad Hall by way of the paddock. Six boatloads of rats with pistols and cutlasses will come up the river and effect a landing in the garden. While a picked body of toads, known as the Death or Glory Toads, will storm the orchard and carry everything before them, yelling for vengeance. 
and there won't be much left of any of you by the time they're through, unless you clear out now while you have a chance. And then I ran away and hid, and took a peep at them through the hedge. They were as nervous and as flustered as could be, running all ways and tripping over each other, everyone giving orders and no one listening. And then I heard them complaining about the weasels, and how they would be feasting in the banqueting hall, while they, the stoats, would be out in the cold and at the mercy of the bloodthirsty badgers. Oh, you silly ass mole, cried Toad. You've spoilt everything. Mole, said the badger quietly. I perceive you have more sense in your little finger than some other animals have in the whole of their fat bodies. You've done splendidly. I've great hopes of you, and you're a very clever little fellow. The toad was simply wild with jealousy, more especially as he couldn't make out for the life of him what the mole had done that was so particularly clever. But before he had time to show his temper or expose himself to Badger's sarcasm, the mole diplomatically led him outside and, seating him in a wicker chair, made him tell all his adventures since his first day in prison. The toad's jealousy quickly became a dizzy happiness. Someone had actually asked to hear the full story of his heroic deeds. And as you understand, I'm sure, they sat out there for a very long time. It was late that evening, and the rat, with an air of excitement and mystery, had summoned them all back into the parlour. The rat himself was ready for all the night should bring. Around his waist, a thick leather belt. Stuck into it, a sword on one side, a cutlass on the other. Then a pair of pistols, a policeman's truncheon, several sets of handcuffs, some bandages and sticking plaster, a flask and a sandwich case. So he stood there, every inch a warrior, and made sure that his three friends equipped themselves similarly from the piles of weapons on the floor. When all was quite ready, the badger with stick in one hand and lantern in the other, gave his instructions. Now then, follow me. Uh, mole first, because I'm very pleased with him. Rat next, and Toad last. And look here, Toady, don't you chatter as much as usual, or you'll be sent back as sure as fate. It was very dark along the river bank, and up at the front, the badger was careful to point out to Mole any roots or holes that might make them trip and the mole passed the information back to the rat, and the rat passed it back to Toad. But Toad was in a world of his own, and wasn't really listening, so it was inevitable. He tripped and fell into the water. Five minutes later, after he'd been hauled out of the river, it was a very wet Toad who brought up the rear of the expedition. The badger led them into a clump of trees beside the bank, where he nosed around, and then murmured, Ah, yes, here we are, and lowered himself quietly into the entrance of the secret passage. The mole followed, then the rat, and last of all, Toad, who didn't find it quite as easy as the others. In the passage it was cold and dark, it was damp and low and narrow, and poor Toad began to shiver, partly because he was wet through and partly in dread of what might be before him. The lantern was far ahead, and he was lagging behind when the rat called, Come on, Toad! And in fear of being left behind, he ran at such a pace to catch up that he collided with the others. Once the animals realised that it was only Toad and not an ambush by the ferrets, they continued. But only after Mole had pleaded with Badger not to send Toad back to the river bank. They'd been in the secret passage for some time when they heard far away, yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound, as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on tables. The passage now began to slope upwards, and the noise grew louder and louder. My, what a time those weasels are having, said the badger, 
Oh, but we'll learn them. We'll learn them good and proper. Won't we, Toad? Those few words from the Badger really bucked up Toad's spirits, and he willingly lent a hand when the Badger said, Ah, here's the trapdoor. Now, all together, heave! And so together they pushed and they heaved and they heaved and they pushed, till the trapdoor was fully opened. And hoisting each other through, they found themselves standing in the pantry. The noise was quite deafening. Only a door stood between them and the enemy. Are we all ready then? said the badger. And his friends nodded their agreement. The battle was about to commence. You have never heard such a noise in all your life as on that momentous night at Toad Hall. The banqueting room was absolutely packed with the wicked wild wooders. Long tables stretched down the entire length of the room and the weasels sat at the tables and on the tables and under the tables. The minstrel gallery was packed to overflowing and there were still more hanging, holding, sitting where they could. You see, it was a very big occasion. They were celebrating the chief weasel's birthday. So he sat at the high table, surrounded by his deputies, feeling very pleased with himself. The assistant chief weasel rose to his feet to announce the speeches. Hello, weasels in wild wooden. silence for the chief weasel. And as those cheers rang out, Ratty, Mole and Toad waited on the Badger's word. Wild Wooders, a word first about our kind host, Mr Toad. <laughs> Dear kind Toad. <laughs> we all know Toad. Hold hard Dear a minute, said Badger. Are we all ready? Right, the hour is come. The badger flung the door open wide, and oh my, what a squealing and screeching filled the air as the four fearless friends went into battle. To the panic-stricken wild wooders, it seemed that the banqueting room was full of monstrous animals. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his cudgel whistling. The mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting his awful war cry, A mole! A mole! Rats, desperate and determined, armed with weapons of every age and variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to twice his ordinary size and determined to get even with the chief weasel. The affair was soon over, and in the utter shambles of the banqueting room, the badger stood back wiping his brow and surveyed the scene. Upturned tables and chairs, broken crockery and a dozen or so dazed and battered weasels on whom the mole was busily engaged in fitting handcuffs. Mole, old fellow, said the badger. Oh, just cut along outside, will you, and look after those stout sentries, uh, though I don't think we'll have much trouble from them tonight. And as Mole vanished through the window, the badger turned to Toad. I want some grub, I do, Toad. So stir your stumps and look lively. Uh, we've got your house back for you, and you don't offer us so much as a sandwich. 
Toad was rather hurt that the badger didn't say pleasant things to him. Still, he bustled about, as did the rat, and they laid out on one table some cold chicken and tongue that had hardly been touched, a plateful of lobster salad, and a whole basket full of French rolls with cheese, butter and celery. Then the mole clambered back through the window with a broad grin on his face, his arms full of rifles. It's all over from what I can make out, he said. As soon as the stoats heard the yells and shrieks from the hall, that they downed their rifles and fled. <laughs> so it's all quiet outside. I, I think I'll join you fellows for supper. The weasel prisoners looked on in awe as the four fearsome animals, still armed, did justice to the remains of the banquet. Badger, a mouthful of ham, a chicken leg in each paw, and a pile of lobster salad before him. Rat, trying to eat two rolls at once, each packed with an assortment of cheese, chicken and lettuce. Mole, at least he used a fork, tucking into the most enormous mixture piled high on his plate. And, of course, Toad. He rose to his feet, then cleared his throat. <coughs> My friends, he said, uh, you, you don't know how happy I am to be back at Toad Hall. But without your help, it would never have happened. So to you, Badger, Mole and Ratty, thank you. Thank you indeed. Two hours later, a very tired Mole set free the weasel prisoners from the back door. They scampered across the garden, amazed that they'd been let off so lightly. Mole locked up the back door and made his way upstairs to bed, where Ratty, Badger and Toad were already fast asleep and dreaming of the happy days that now lay ahead of them. The following morning, Toad came down to breakfast late as usual. The Mole and the Water Rat were chatting on the lawn, and Badger was sitting in an armchair deep in the morning paper. I'm afraid there's a heavy morning's work in front of you, Toad, he said, without looking up from his paper. You see, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It's expected of you, so I suggest that straight after breakfast you write out invitations to all our friends, and we'll have them delivered before luncheon. What? cried the toad. Me stop indoors and write letters on a jolly morning like this? I, I... Oh, yes, well, if you insist, dear badger, then it shall be done. <laughs> now, you go and join our young friends in the garden. I shall sacrifice this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The badger eyed him very suspiciously, but said nothing as Toad sat at the writing desk and straightway put pen to paper. And from what he wrote, it was obvious that the coming banquet was to be an all-Toad affair. It was noon, and Toad had finished all his letters and arranged for their delivery when the other animals came into the room. They marched up and stood defiantly before him. The rat spoke first. Now look here, Toad, he said. It's about this banquet. Let me tell you once and for all, there are to be no speeches and no songs. We know what you're up to. We stopped the messenger boy and read your invitations. Mayn't I sing just one little song? pleaded Toad, piteously. Not even one, said the Badger firmly. You know that all your songs and speeches are conceit, boasting and vanity. Toad, it's for your own good, said the Mole. Do you want to be the laughing stock of the stoats and weasels? Toad left the room with faltering footsteps, his handkerchief pressed to his eyes. Badger, said the rat, I feel like a brute. I know, I know, said the badger, 
but it had to be done. It had to be done. My, oh my, what a gathering there was that night at Toad Hall. From near and far came the animals to celebrate Toad's return. And when Toad made his entry down the sweeping staircase, a great cheer rang out from the assembled animals. They gathered round, congratulating him and saying nice things about his courage, his cleverness and his fighting qualities. But Toad only smiled faintly and murmured, oh, not at all. And, oh, good heavens, no, it was Badger, Mole and Rat who bore the brunt of the fighting. It was the same after dinner. From around the great banqueting room came a chorus of cries for Toad to make merry as in the old days. But Toad only shook his head gently and raised one paw in mild protest. But if the other animals were amazed at Toad's modesty, Badger, Ratty and Mole were absolutely astounded. He was indeed an altered Toad. After this great climax, the four animals led their lives in happy contentment. Toad sent presents to the jailer's daughter and the engine driver. He even compensated the bargewoman for the loss of her horse, though under severe compulsion from Badger. Sometimes in the course of long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll in the wild wood, now successfully tamed as far as they were concerned, and they'd be greeted respectfully by the inhabitants. And the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the door and say, look, there goes the great Mr. Toad and the gallant water rat. And that's the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you've so often heard your father speak. And they'd tell them that if they were not good, the terrible badger would up and get them. Which, of course, was quite untrue. For Badger was really very fond of children, but it never failed to have its full effect. And that is the story of the wind in the willows. But I'm sure you'll all agree that it would be most unkind not to thank all those who made the story possible. Animals, large and small, from near and far, and a few humans as well, who gave up so much of their time to take part. Especially we thank Mole, Ratty, Badger, and the one and only Mr. Toad. But above all, we are indebted to their creator, Kenneth Graham.